welcome aboard let's hide this thing here all right welcome aboard welcome aboard um, this uh, uh, Sunday let's open up my Facebook on my phone to make sure I can be my volume is up and I'm being heard do we have volume y'all know I gotta do a test every time I start this video do we have volume <clears throat> testing volume yeah that's pretty good volume okay so that's pretty good let's get the overview <clears throat> Where's my overview at? Well, all the videos attached to that. Okay, so um, welcome to another topic here. The name of this topic is Welcome, Beautiful Body of Christ, and those who will be a part of the Body of Christ. Welcome to you all here. This is the day that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, has made, and we will be rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> I don't normally do videos on Sunday a lot, but this one, I wanted to do a video. God put it in my heart to share with you a video on symbolism, double cross symbolism. Cordially, the name of the title of this video is The Double Cross. The Double Cross. The double cross and the double cross serves of Jesus Christ. Those are not prescription ones. These are <laughs> the double crosses of Jesus Christ. The Judas, if you can read the headlines, it'll say the Judas Judah. His name by birth was Judah backstabbing double cross done to Jesus the son of man was and is much bigger I'm supposed to say then I put the by accident then a man named Judas what can a simple Oreo cookie bakery design tell us about this let's go let me edit that real quick though It should read. <clears throat> it's much bigger than than a n. Much bigger than a man named Judas. Okay, so that's been changed. All right, so <clears throat> let's go into this. I'm going to use my other phone. Use this phone here. I mean, oh, you can't see because I had the thing on in the background. But I'm going to um, use that phone too keep checking up on Facebook but anyway <clears throat> we progress and you might be wondering what the Oreo cookie is in the background I'm going to show you some things in a minute the Oreo cookie in the background is symbolic yes an Oreo cookie you're not you're not uh, you're not mistaken about what you're seeing there all right we might be with you for a few hours here you're not mistaken what you're seeing there the oil it is an oil cookie look well, let me just kind of scooch to the side a little bit here move out of the way all right oreo cookie there it is <clears throat> and as you can see the oreo cookie has some symbolism going on a lot of symbolism that uh that one that looks like a four leaf clover I'm not going to touch on that because I haven't really delved into it but that's going to be symbolic, symbolic as well <clears throat> what I want to deal with is that Roman Catholic Byzantine double cross that you see there um, it is Byzantine Christianity that circle that adjoins it at the bottom 
we want to talk about that. We don't want to take, talk about the word, word Oreo because there's really nothing to that they go, I've gotten. Um, we want to talk about that little symbol directly under that. If you can see that, maybe I can just pull that down a little bit and make it so you can see it better. You see that symbol right there? Maybe I can point at it. Right over. Oh, oh, I'm not going to to disappear. Right over. Right, right over. Wait. Right. I'm sorry about this. I got like my, my, my um CGI or whatever they call it. Thing. Right here. Wait. I got to bring my hand up. Right. Right. <laughs> right down there. Down there. You see right right under the, the okay, let me just use it duty open. See my cursor going in circles? This is my cursor, my arrow. Right down here, you see that? That's that is a that is a that is the head like a Baphomet type of head, okay? That is that is um horned beast sim symbology. I've never never noticed that. That is a horned beast symbology right there. See that now? But more importantly, but before we get into this later on, into some type, into Baphomet, talking about the devil's signs and symbols. <clears throat> Let's deal with this circle right here, adjoined to this antenna. It looks like also it looks like an antenna. I, I was, never thought to myself that it, it is. It is a Roman Catholic cross. Okay, so uh, it is Byzantine. Okay, so look. This circle and this symbol, the double cross. Let's see how it connects to Christ being double crossed by Satan. I mean by Judas. Judas started out, he was a, uh, um, Judas or Judah, Judas. He was a, um, a disciple of John the Baptist right he was a disciple of John the Baptist and John preached repentance okay John it was John's repentance was John's gospel eternal life in Christ Jesus is Jesus's gospel Which doesn't which doesn't um, erase repentance, but it actually enhances it. Really, it really, you know, believing on Jesus Christ, Jesus comes in by the Holy Spirit and teaches us how to repent, how to change. No sinner can repent without Jesus. No sinner can repent without a, a born again spirit. The old man, the old spirit, the old soul, <clears throat> knoweth not the things of God, cannot discern the things of God. Why? Because the things of God are only spiritually discerned, it says in the scripture. So, <clears throat> in order for someone to repent or change, they would need in them a spirit, a new spirit, one that is more created like more like the Holy Spirit living and active that can bear fruit which brings about change repentance it's not as simple as yelling repent repent although the terminology is used in the Bible John did more to cry not repent meaning change but it, it's just a, a top a simple base word to let you know that I'm telling you the word repent but what's going to happen is you're going to repent you're going to repent nobody's going to force you to repent you're going to want to repent you're going to because when you believe on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in you when you meet this God you're going to fall in love and what's going to happen is you're not going to be afraid of him like you're not going to be introduced to him by threats of hell or anything like that that's false gospel you're going to be introduced to him by just simply being told that uh, we were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity because Adam and Eve not Eve alone 
Adam and Eve, not Adam alone. 50-50 marriage. Adam and Eve and Eve both. <clears throat> of course, what they did, they caused everyone else to be born in sin and shaped in iniquity. <clears throat> and you're going to be told that. And you're going to be told that God put on human flesh and became Jesus Christ in order to redeem us from that curse. The curse of sin. You're going to be told things like this if you hear me preach the gospel. The sins that you do on a daily basis and that I do have nothing to do and ha or have done have nothing to do with just poop appearing out of nowhere and we just decided to do that so we created that sin. No, it is a product and or a byproduct of being dead in sin. Speaking to the unbeliever. To the believer, it's just a matter of weaning, being weaned off of that. Uh, the the, the, the um, byproduct of, you know, once it's produced. But to the believer, the core, the very core of sin that, Adam, that we were born in because of Adam and Eve, this has been pruned, it has been uprooted by Jesus Christ. And it doesn't just happen automatically like Kenneth Hagin and them used to say. You're just saved automatically because he already did the work. No, there's, there's something that has to be done. We have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe that he is God and that his Father is God and their Holy Spirit is God. We have to believe the message of Jesus Christ <clears throat> concerning his Father. That he thought it not robbery to be equal with his Father. He and his Father are one. He is God. He came to redeem us from the curse of sin. All we have to do is believe that, that He is God, and that His Father is God, and that, and that He came to save us. But we believe that message in our heart. The Holy Spirit comes in and recreates a new spirit within you and I. We become now known as born again. We are no longer sinners. We are <clears throat> former sinners that was saved by grace okay so when we are saved by grace we are no longer sinners however even though the root that root sin has been taken up we've been rescued from that root sin by having by being recreated a new a new spirit I create within you at new birth born of the spirit the carnal soul that we're normally used to giving into before we get saved. Now we need to be trained to put that to to death, to bring it under subjection and keep it under subjection, and put it to spiritual death. For it wars the flesh, it wars against. And preaching the Lord does preaching the law does not help the gospel of Jesus. Preaching the law helps the flesh. That's why Romans eight makes it very clear. The law, sin, and death, and the flesh are interchangeable. They are the same team. They are the same team. And they bring about condemnation, guilt. That's why every legalistic preacher wants, wants every sinner just to be guilted by what they're saying about, you're a sinner, you do this. They already know that they do that. They already know that they do that. So why would they need you to, or me to remind them of that in order to so-called get them saved. No. It's not beholding sin that people are transformed spiritually and have a new spirit created within them. It's beholding Jesus, the forgiver of sins. Okay? Keep that in mind. It's not beholding sin what's the law, preaching the law causes us to do to people, make them behold their own sins, that they may feel guilty enough to know it's beholding Jesus that causes people to have a new, to go into belief. It's, it's beholding Jesus through the gospel of Jesus preached. Not just the gospel of Jesus' love, which is, the, which has a counterfeit gospel, which has no filter, which means you can do whatever you want. That's false. But the, but the true gospel of Jesus, which is the gospel of Jesus' love and forgiveness and mercy and kindness and grace, and the fact that he forgave, he died to forgive sins. 
of everybody. No one is more simple than the other. Right? Everybody equally sin. So, the true gospel speaks to that, the forgiveness of sin. It doesn't go into detail what that sin is, to try to make their personal sin, make them feel guilty to come to God. Because that, that would be the same equivalent as what the law tried to do. That's why Christ removed the law. Nobody, if anybody says that Christ didn't remove the law, they, they are disobeying the contents of Gal, the letter to Gal, Lydia, the, Galat the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews and a few other books. They are disobeying blatantly because they want to hold the law and the preaching of Aaron and the preaching of the Mosaic law over people's head to get them saved. There is therefore now no condemnation, no, no judging of guilt in Christ Jesus. Right? One, there's not, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Two, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who walk not after the flesh, but who walk in the spirit. But what the law does is it's really, even though the law is pretending to preach the gospel of Jesus and trying to stamp out the head of the true love of God by stamping out the head of the false gospel, love gospel, is it is helping the flesh. It is not helping the flesh in a good way. It is helping the flesh to continue. It is helping the flesh, the fire, is helping to fire for the fire onto the fuel of sin in the flesh. The law of sin and death are a package deal, spiritual death are a package deal. They are also called the flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit. Read Romans chapter 8. So, the true gospel of Jesus Christ does not preach hell torment. It does not. That's not love. In the scripture, it says that we just read the other day. What, what is it again? God is love. And love is God. And uh, we that dwell in God, I'm paraphrasing. When we dwell in God, He dwells in us. The love of God is in us because God is in us because He is love. But then it goes on to say that fear those who fear are not made perfect in love are not made mature in God right perfect love mature love casts out fear and it says it goes on to say because fear comes with torment right the preaching on hell is it brings about fear that a uh, false fear that comes with torment it brings about fear which brings about torment that's that's the very opposite of the love of God the very opposite of the love of God many people don't believe that because they won't they only want to believe what they want to believe the scripture clearly states that God is love and when he dwells in us the love of God dwells in us and when the love of God dwells in us Whatever we say, if we preach that gospel, we're not going to bring about anything to, to try to make, to try to drum up fear in people of torment. Fear of torment. Yeah, because I, if I tell you about hell, and you just, your sin's going to take you there, it's talking to the unbeliever, right? Then maybe you'll be scared enough and guilty enough to give your life to Christ. Well, that's called compulsion. That's called muscling somebody. That's called forcing someone psychologically. It's called witchcraft. Every legalistic preacher is doing witchcraft and they don't realize it. The love of God does not come with spreading of fear and torment, nor does it come with that other erroneous stuff that T.D. Jakes teaches about God created fear in us, so we have to embrace it and use it. God created fear in us, but the spirit of fear is wrong, but fear is not. That, that is a blatant witchcraft sermon when it's trying to get people to um, glorify fear. Because when you glorify fear, it eradicates, it, it, it attempts to eradicate, the, if you're a Christian, the love of God within you. It does. So again, we progress.
The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But that scripture should not say the English word fear because it is Hebrew or Greek. And it comes from that particular word, which literally means respect and honor. The respect and honor of God is wisdom, not fear. They, they want to, in the English language world, they want to exchange the words. They want to make fear can mean respect and honor. And honor can mean respect and fear because they're coming from the same Greek, Latin, or Hebrew word. Never understanding that that Greek, Hebrew, or Latin word does have more than one meaning. But it assigns each of those meanings to the proper context of a certain thing. So, the Greek word for, for fear can be the same Greek word for honor and or respect. <clears throat> it all depends on the context of what you are speaking or the, uh, the existing context. Content. Your context. So, to fear God, to fear God is the beginning of wisdom. The, the, really reads the respect and honor of God. It's the level, of, it's the beginning of wisdom. This, this, this will call, help us to understand. This will actually keep us from taking that word fear when it comes to reverencing God. It also means reverence. Uh, that group, the original Hebrew and Greek word for that means reverence. This will understanding this will cause us as Christians to not do what religion taught us to do to assign that word fear in the in in the in the definition that comes with it, like being afraid of dying, being afraid of burning forever, or being afraid of a roaring lion about to devour you. When it comes to fearing God which really means respecting and honoring and reverencing God. It does, it will, uh, having this understanding will help us to not, to realize that Isaiah 41 should never be undermined. Because in Isaiah 41 verse 13, actually verse 11, 12, 13, 8 through, 8 through 16, should never be undermined. The meaning of fear there God is make, letting, letting Jacob know the difference. There is a fear and or a spirit of fear that alludes to being afraid of dying or being afraid of whatever, being petr you know, petrified or what they say, or being you know, afraid of death or afraid of being attacked or afraid of whatever. You know, afraid of someone, you know, that is about to do something that's going to cause you pain on any level on any and every level God is telling Jacob that fear is a sin that fear is not of me so I wouldn't tell you to fear me that way I would tell you to honor and respect me that way I mean to honor and respect me but I would not tell you to fear me meaning that the translator of the Bible put fear there the words fear to throw the reader off Okay, the, the, the correct English word there is respect, honor, and reverence of God. For, but, but the correct word from that same Hebrew word um, for Isaiah chapter 41 is fear. Because God said, do not fear. I will be with you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Right? That, that was on Bible, King James Bible app today, but I was using it like two days ago. Bless God. So, the, um, the, um, scriptures like that that pertain to God telling people to fear not make it, makes it very clear that there's a difference between the English word fear that the translator translated there and its Hebrew counterpart and the other English word fear and its Hebrew counterpart which means when God's saying the word fear he's not going to use the word fear if he's talking about reverence and respect the translators of the Bible will do that because they're under compulsion of King James they're under compulsion and fear of the king you know, and or of popes and stuff like that see 
but the original authors of these things like Paul and Peter and Isaiah and all these people that wrote these things they wrote the, the Hebrew and Greek words for our English counterpart words and those in, those Hebrew and Greek words again when translated into our English language can have a plethora of different meanings different words in other words you just have to assign the right definition and I mean the right word and meaning to the correct situation or to, to the correct um, what do you call it it's a simple word leaving my head gotta bring back to me um, context, context to the correct context and, and that's why studying the Bible has to be done by being led by the Holy Spirit no one that studies the Bible should study without praying first and then being led by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth and also causes us to rightly divide, meaning dissect anything that is true or anything that calls itself true. And dissection is a lot, it's very vast. It's picking apart them words, it's knowing the definitions of those things so we can know originally what God meant when he said that or this. So, the love of God also, the love of God does rebuke and expose falsities and falsehoods. It does. Didn't, didn't Jesus tell when, when Peter meant well? He was trying to save Jesus' life from the crucifixion. Didn't Jesus tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan? Well, what is Peter doing wrong? He sounded like, if you read what he was saying there, it sounded like he was trying to keep Jesus from being crucified. Like, if you put it in modern day language, this is almost like Peter was saying, from what I can tell, don't worry, Lord, we're not going to let nothing happen to you. We got you, and I got you back. I won't let these things happen to you, these things that you keep prophesizing. Jesus didn't say, oh, thank you, please, have my back, have my says, my boy. No, Jesus said, to the spirit that was influencing Peter to save what he said get thee behind me Satan because you save the things of man of the human flesh and not the things of God <clears throat> what do you mean the things of God is God G the Jesus Christ and God the Father Yahweh and God the Holy Spirit it is their will and desire for the Son of God to ransom his life to give his life as a ransom not to be rescued by Peter or anyone how many Christians keep in fear keep saying he could have called 10,000 angels he could have he could have he could have even if just because you know my kingdom not of this world if my kingdom was of this world they would no doubt not be killing me okay what did Jesus mean when he told Pilate that If my kingdom was of this world, was like-minded to this world, to the world's, Satan's kingdom. Satan, the god of this world, also got a feminine name called Gaia. The spirit or god of the earth. The god of the world. Gaia, Satan, the god of this world. That's the feminine version. <clears throat> if, my, my, if my kingdom were of this world, it would no doubt fight to save me I'm not saying that's a good thing I'm saying that I'm showing you Pilot, Pontius Pilate I'm showing you your world in a nutshell if my kingdom were, had the mindset of your kingdom it would try to fight to stop the, the very sacrifice that was set up to save the world from hell and sin, sin and hell it would fight to save me it would be privy to fighting to save me because your kingdom, the kingdom of the world, is privy to saving itself and trying to stop itself from dying and trying to save, stop, save its leaders, its favorite leaders that it likes. Fighting on their behalf, if not physically, then verbally, debating in their behalf, defending the Antichrist, defending the popes, defending the world leaders with their mouth, 
defending their favorite false prophets that they don't know are false standing in the pulpits. Your world is privy to doing that, Jesus is telling Pontius Pilate. If my kingdom were like that, then they would do the same thing. That's what he's saying. He's not he's not saying they would save me like it was a good it would be a good thing. Like they'll come down here and they'll kick you, but that's not what he's saying. The pride of Christianity, because they're afraid to die, um, always say that. And I guess sometimes, you know, out of a good nature they're trying to they think they're trying to because it hurts to watch the Savior die. So again, everybody wants at that point wants to rescue Jesus. So again, we just put religion in Easter, put that in our mind. You want to rescue Jesus. But rescuing Jesus would be the equivalent of committing suicide for the whole world. Spiritual suicide. Right? Just like Jesus told Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for trying to keep him from being crucified. For trying to put it in his mind even. Hey, look, we're not going to let this happen. All these things you keep saying is going to happen to you, we're not going to let it happen. We're going to stop. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's how we know that Rome added to the text of the Garden of Gethsemane and made Jesus do the same thing Peter did. Well, that would that would make Jesus a hypocrite, wouldn't it? If he were to tell his father, "Take this cup from uh, suffering and death for me," that I, uh, because I don't want to do it no more. If it be your will, I'll do it if you want me to, but I don't really want to do it. I'm afraid. I don't, I want to die. I'm scared. If he does that, then everything he said to Peter about "Get thee behind me, P Satan," would be undone. You see, undone. Not even if he gets a hold of it in about five minutes and okay, I was losing my mind for a minute, but I got a hold of myself. No, it's too late now. Now you got to go apologize to Peter for cast for casting the devil out of him, for rebuking him. See, that's how we know Jesus never said, "Father, take this cup from me." They added that to the text to make it seem like Jesus did the very thing, like he was giving up, like he was scared to die, like he was in fear. The very thing that Jesus himself, when he was God in the Old Testament, warned his people and God in the New Testament, him and his Father and Holy Spirit constantly warning their servants, do not be afraid, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness, I will not let anything happen to you. All of a sudden is in the garden, knocking his knees together, sweating profusely because of Satan. Remember, Satan is the one supposedly bringing the temptation on him to be afraid. He's giving in to Satan. All of a sudden, Satan is breaking him. In the garden, somehow. He's not. Rome added it. They wrote their own stuff. And by the time ours got translated from Greek, they had already created their own Greek versions. All they did was add a little... They didn't change much. All they did was add a little leavens in between chapters. To subvert... To pervert... The personality of God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus is not afraid and never has been afraid. Not even in his human flesh. I've heard the excuses time and time again. Well, this, isn't it written that he is touched by the feelings of our infirmities? He even cried for Lazarus being dead. He is touched by the feelings of our weaknesses. But he never gives in to the weaknesses of his own flesh. See that? How that works? If the Garden of Gethsemane was true, that what, ha what they said he did there and went into fear and didn't want to die no more, well then he gave in to the infirmities of his flesh, of his weakness, the weaknesses of his flesh, which means that's sin, which means he fails his mission, which means all of these false prophets like Fred Price and all these guys preaching about the garden and what he did there using that to justifiably make him a sinner and hit with his own sin they would be justifiably right from preaching for preaching that but they're not because it was false scripture added by Rome for every false prophet of every generation to preach from to misconstrue the true personality of Jesus Christ. Now back to this. 
there is a double cross at play. The double cross on the Oreo cookie, who's ever baking these cookies, who's ever baking these cookies, is putting these things right in our face. There's clearly a Baphomet ram's head right at the bottom of that circle. Who's ever in that double T? This is the Byzantine. The Byzantine double cross. They have Byzantine has a couple of Christian crosses, false Christian cr crosses. Byzantine Christianity is is the the child of Roman Catholicism. It is not true Christianity. That's they they every single cross that they make, even the single cross. Every single cross that they make, it doesn't represent Jesus at all. Jesus never chose for any symbol to rep on earth to represent him in any way. Not stars, not crosses, not any of those things. That was all man-made, done by religious figureheads deceiving the planet. That's what it was done by. It, it's really the early cross after the crucified Christ and they crucified a few people on it. But after they specifically after they crucified Christ on it, they used that cross as a symbol of, of intimidation. Flaming or not flaming, they use it as a sign of intimidation, the occult, with the long long hoodies. Not the KKK, them too. They're the sons of Rome, of the Vatican. That's why they dress like them. They are say, the, the every KKK are Satan. We don't. They don't ever get the credit for this. They just hate black people. No, they're Satanists. They sacrifice people. Yeah, and and they have day jobs in town as your local butcher, baker, candlestick maker, judge, milkman, ice cream man. You know. They hold in, in certain towns in those days in the 1800s, they held certain positions, but they were the ones that met up to, to meet secretly around the pentagram star and pray to the devil. How do we know? If you got the satanic hoodies on and you're burning the torches, you are basically showing us that you are Satanists. You are not r just simply racist, hating white supremacists, hating black people. You are Satanists. Every time you hang a black person and set them on fire from a tree, it is a satanic ritual, at, um, uh, like a holocaust ritual. It is a, 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 a satanic burnt offering offered to Satan, whatever deity that they're worshipping, the KKK. They're very demonic people. And now they're trying to be smart, Alex, and even let black people join got videos of a black man hugging his white KKK buddy. Who's the new enemy? The Jews? Who's oh they're the old enemy. Who's the new enemy? Blacks and Jews are the old enemies of the KKK. Who's the new enemies? Mexicans? And every other race? But yeah, they are Satanists, but the Vatican used the cross originally as a symbol of intimidation to show you this is where you'll go up on this thing if you defy us or disobey us or just having a simple opinion against us if you don't pay our taxes if you don't you know eventually we'll get you if you don't you know worship our gods eventually we'll get you if you don't you know eventually we'll find a way to convict to convict you of a crime even if you don't commit it so that we can hang you from this and when you put another cross on that it doubles it it's symbolically representing a double cross Jesus being double crossed how do we know Jesus was double crossed let's look at that Jesus is double crossed first of all let's read from Psalms 41. Let's read from Psalms 41. Thank you. 
Psalms 41, KJB. Did it hear me? Psalms 41, KJV. Yeah. Bible Gateway is good. I'm thinking about verse 9, but let's read down. What does it say? Unfortunately, even my reading glasses, I can't see that far with that. What does it say? If Psalms 41, verse 9. Let's read from verse 1. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Verse 2. Psalm the, 41, King James Version 41. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. 2. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. I guess Google is a better reader than I am. Okay, so blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him from trouble. The Lord will preserve and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him into the hands, I'm sorry, deliver him into the will of his enemies. His hands, something, right? The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of Languishing. Time to charge. It's time to charge, my friends. The Lord will deliver him upon his. Upon the bed of languishings. Thou wilt make all his bed. in his sickness verse 4 I said Lord be merciful unto me heal my soul for I have sinned on uh, against you my enemies speak evil of me when shall he die and his name perish be very careful because there are witches right now and spiritualists that have been writing books that uh, that has the book of Psalms in it and they use the book of Psalms as ways to teach their followers this is Christianity and God wants you to curse your enemies and they right here in the book of Psalms and they, and they use Psalms and they even call it spells from the Bible if you treat these these scriptures like spells you are damning yourself you know, but they're turning it into grimoire spells, okay? This is, I think this David just crying out. This is his own opinion when he's crying out. It's not meant to become something that we do to get God to get our enemies. Go get them, God. Because God already told us, love your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Bless and don't curse. Do not do this. Okay, so it says... Bless them and don't curse them, is what it says, right? So this here, he's denouncing him. He's cursing his enemies. Where are you going to get them, God? Well, they are said in Revelations, those that have gone on before the Lord, is it is prophesied in Revelations. Um, God told John, chapter 6, that um, the, the blood of those that are crying out on a satanic altar that have been sacrificed in the earth by being martyred uh, for Christ are crying out, Lord, when you when will you avenge us? That's the same thing as this, but it's not meant to be turned. Those scriptures are not meant to be turned into get them God weapons against anybody. Otherwise, it becomes exactly what what they're trying to make it become witchcraft. So let's make that keep that clear. It says, "My enemies speak evil of me. When shall when shall they die, and his name and his name perish? <clears throat> and if he come to see me, he speaketh vanity." This, I mean, all of that belief system of get them God because David can say stuff like that. This is why in the many of the church pulpits today, there are prideful people standing looking down and won't let you have an opinion against what they're teaching. 
touch not my anointed, you put your mouth on me and all this other stuff and God's going to get you, comes right up out of the midst of witchcraft, control, the inability to handle constructive criticism from just somebody in the pews asking a simple question. If you're wrong about something, you don't want to be, uh, you know, checked by a simple pew sitter. It has to be somebody high in rank, really. Was Jeremiah higher in rank in the earth than the kings of the earth? Technically, he was, I mean, being God's servant, but in their minds, was he? Nope. But yet, he spoke to them and against them anyway. Was Isaiah in earth position? Was he higher than the king of Babylon and Ezekiel, the king of Tyrus? But yet, they prophesied against them anyway, didn't they? When David sinned and Nathan prophesied against him, was Nathan higher in rank than David? Did they both love God? Yes, they did. Was Nathan higher than David in rank? No, he was not. Yet David had to admit that he was he had done the crime that he did. Don't cut off the head of the messenger just because they seem to be lower in rank. You see? They seem to be. And God doesn't really, or his people don't really deal with rank. So shall it not be among you. You will not be like the rulers of the Gentiles holding rank and lordship and being the leader of each other. So shall it not be among you. Be servants of each other instead, Jesus said. But there's other things in the Bible that go opposite to that. Well, that's just proof that people were disrespecting and, and, and rebelling against what Jesus said. You know, even back then. Again. And he, and if he comes, he see me speaking vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me do they devise my hurt. An evil disease, say they, say that, say they, cleaveth fast unto him. And now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. Now, I don't know if David was physically sick at the time and they were, people were jumping on him about that. They were finally trying to use that sickness because Christians, high minded Christians, do that to other Christians as well. When, when, uh, especially those that think they need to be followed by certain Christians that won't follow them, they'll say, "When that when that Christian gets sick, they'll say, see there, you should have been following me." I've heard that before in the ministry. The cursed things that comes from the lips of these leaders in these pulpits against the people in the pews that they refuse to submit down to and allow to check them when they're wrong. David I don't know if it's David's sick at the time and so they're using that against him he's sick because you know this and that because he's crazy because he keeps saying he hears God and he don't because of whatever whatever you know they could be saying anything against David or maybe he's not sick maybe they're just spreading rumors that he has a disease that he himself is a disease and everything that he says from God is a disease see an evil disease, they say, cleaveth unto him. The way he's saying that is uh, as if he's not really physically sick at all, so they're making up things. And now that he lieth, he shall rise no more. Now that he's laying down, he shall rise no more. Yea, mine own family, our familiar friends. I think I'm in the wrong chapter. Am I wrong, right? Yea, my familiar friends, in whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. Wow. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requite them. Maybe he is sick. Raise me up. Hmm. 
This don't feel like the right chapter. What am I reading here? Psalms 41 9. Psalms 41 9, right? It's not the right chapter. Well, it is what I'm looking at here. Verse 9. That's what I'm going for. Let's just read verse 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which, uh, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Okay, so that's the main thing we want to run with here because we're talking about Judas. We're going to go back to Judas, and I keep going and talking about a lot of stuff, but we're going to go back to this. It's Judas we're talking about, okay? Not just Judas, but Judas representing his real birth name, Judah. Judas is the son of perdition. Son of perdition means son of hell, son of ruin. So Judas... This thing that David said was being used online as a type and shadow of Judas. Um, like it's a prophetic word that Judas is going to come and do this. You could use that. I mean, I mean, he's not talking about Judas. It's not, he's not prophesying. It seems like David is talking about something that's really happening to him in the moment. So apparently David had some Judases himself in his, I mean, in his own life. But it is similar, the scripture verse, this verse 9 is similar to uh, Judas. So that's why I want to read verse 9, because the next verse that goes with it. Verse 9, Psalm, Psalms 41 verse 9. Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. Well, that's just like Judas. Where am I? Um, are these the ones that... Those are the broken ones. That's just like Judas. Okay, let's let's go back. Let's see if we can find something. The Judas scripture. John 13, 18. John 13, 18. Can I get this thing to talk? Can I talk to this thing again? Let's find out. Oops. That's the wrong one. John chapter thirteen. I'm not going to read the whole. According to KingJamesBibleOnline.org, John chapter 13 Bible options plus text size. One now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Okay, so we're getting into the, the Lord's Supper. Okay, so I'm not going to read the whole thing because we'll be having three or four different topics and three or four different sermons at one time. I'll just read the verse. Verse 18 says, And I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me have lifted up his heel against me. Now that's exactly what kind of what David was just saying, right? He that ate at my table, my 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 um familiar friend betrayed me, right? This is what Jesus is talking about, Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me. Now, maybe that scripture was, David's situation was turned into 
a type and shadow of Judas because he said as the scripture the scripture fulfilled unless there's another scripture that says it in the Old Testament he that eateth bread with me have lifted up his heel against me and this is what Jesus meant when he told me back in 2008 when he showed me a dream of Barack Obama he was not president at the time he was up on stage with a panel of people about 12 maybe 13 people and they were just being introduced as those who were running back then and then I saw a dream which caused me to admire him and God told me not to admire him because that in this dream I was breaking bread at a table with him that was similar to the Lord's Supper table but also but it was a, a modern day corrupt version of the Lord's Supper table because it was more like a, a, a board meeting room table and the, the would-be disciples that would be normally around the table listening to Jesus was wearing their suits in this dream standing around in different cat groups talking to each other like standing in a board room which makes one really bored and Barack Obama in that dream my mom in the dream which represented something that Christ revealed to me back then she represented the true body of Christ the true bride of Christ the true bride, body of Christ and even him, the Lord, the body, handed me a, a bread. I handed that bread to Barack Obama in his dream, and he took it and broke off, off a piece of it. By the time I wake up from this dream, I'm saying, oh, I'm breaking bread with this man. I'm thinking this man could be the next president, is what, what the Lord trying to show me. And God told me not to marvel at him, do not worship him, and I'm going to teach you what I'm showing you in this dream. The Lord told me that that dream represents oh, Barack Obama represented Judas the son of perdition that's what he said he represents the son of perdition what is and who is the son of perdition Satan and, and, and carnate human flesh the scripture says Satan entered Judas right okay let's read that Let's read that. John 13, 18. Again, rises the possibility that Jesus chose Judas. Jesus didn't choose Judas. I hate when these people on here write things like that. Let's read the scripture. It says, I spake not to you all. I spoke not of, I spoke not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me have lifted up his heel against me. He's not saying I'm choosing Judas. That's, that's, where, they, that's where they're screwing it up. He's not saying that I'm choosing Judas to betray me. Judas is already a conniver, okay? That makes it makes it seem like God of heaven is not giving this this human being any choice but to betray Jesus, and that's why they come up with all Hollywood comes up with all kinds of storylines about the re redeeming Judas and you know having Judas get mad enough at God. Why'd you make me do it? Why'd you choose me then? Because of fictitious misconstruings of scriptures like this, Jesus did not choose, and God the Father and Holy Spirit did not choose Judas to betray Jesus. That would mean like they're, they're acting against themselves. I need somebody to betray me. Let me get somebody to do it. I'm not setting the stage for that. I already know that the devil is going to use one of mine to betray me. Judas is not really my disciple. He's John the Baptist's disciple, which reads that he really was not a disciple of John the Baptist either. Not a loyal one, I mean. Okay? Not one to be trusted. You never know how Ju John the Baptist got, you know, how they picked him up. Maybe they just picked him up because they knew who he was, or maybe somebody told them where John the Baptist was. We never know. But anyway, Judas used to be his thing, right? His disciple. 
He betrayed Jesus. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so anyway, I want to add to the scripture. So anyway, uh, now I tell you before I, before it come, that when it, is, it come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me, receives my father. Then he goes into this. He goes, it says, verse 21 says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. How much troubled in spirit? If I'm the one choosing him and, and I'm, I'm setting it up, why would I be troubled in my spirit? He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, which means truly, truly, I say to you, Who's the foundation of the truth? The church of the Bible. Neither. Jesus Christ. Okay, to answer that question that was on Facebook earlier in the Catholic thread. Je Jesus Christ is, is the foundation of, the, of truth. The Bible is a testimony of, of that truth. The church is um, the body of Christ or messengers of that truth. Okay, so when Jesus, but Jesus is the foundation. Um, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now he literally, I think this is the scripture that he literally tells Judas to his face. That's you, buddy. And it says here, Then the disciples look, looked at each other, doubting whom, uh, of who he was speaking about. And and there was leaning on on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples Jesus loved. That's John. Okay? Uh, Simon Peter therefore beckoned him that he should ask. Uh, beckoned him that, that he should ask who... Wait a minute. Simon Peter therefore beckoned unto him that he, he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto, the, unto him, then he laid on Jesus' breast with John, right? Said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he, when he had uh, dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas. Iscariot, the son of Simon, a different Simon. <laughs> then after the sop, then after the sop, Satan entered into him. Hear that? After the sop, you know, after he, Judas, took the sop, whether it was before he ate it or after he ate it, or or after he ate it, it was after Jesus gave it to him. Another, another disciple said. That Jesus, uh, that that Judas already had his own, and dipped it after Jesus, because Jesus said, "After I dip mine, he will dip his." So, to complete the full uh, thing about what both disciples are trying to write, Jesus gave Judas the, the sop. Jesus dipped his and ate it. And Judas, mimicking him, dipped his and ate it right behind him. Then at that point, I, I believe at that point, that's when Satan did him. But he says here, and when he had dipped the south, he gave it to Judas. But the other, the other scripture said that Judas dipped after him, meaning Judas dipped his own thing. So sometimes when you're there, when the disciples are there, they just, you know, some of them, when they're rewriting what they did, some of them have a better memory than other, other ones did, do. That's how we know. That's why we're saying the Bible is not infallible. The Bible is not infallible. The scriptures are not infallible because, again, you know, 
sometimes the disciples when it, it doesn't even you put nobody adding to it and taking away from it. it sometimes when it's translated the cor um, by correct way that's put in the hands of the translators they're correcting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the right way but at the same time some disciples have because they wrote this years after it happened so they're going by a past memory when they're writing and they're not perfect they're human you know so when they're translating yes they're inspired by the Holy Ghost to translate but when they're translating they're not doing it perfectly that's how we know one will say he dipped his own sock the other will say well this one this one right here I'll, I'll dip it for him and then give it to him it would behoove us to believe that the other disciple that wrote about this that said Jesus that Judas dipped his own sock was not fully paying attention or maybe just to remember as well as this writer because which is John I think it is because he wasn't fully paying attention it's plausible that that particular writer of that particular gospel did not see Jesus hand it to him he assumed that Judas had it the whole time himself but then it's still in completely line up because they saw Judas dip it they said which means they're not going fully by they're not getting the right full capacity of their memory when they're writing this so when the translators translate it they're translating they're either they're translating from a disciple who does not have the full capacity of his memory when he's writing the gospel for the first time years after it happened or the translators are just messing up themselves because they're not perfect okay so again either or we see imperfection even on ink with paper there's imperfection there so there's no infallibility there okay so it says and after the south satan entered into him and jesus said unto him that thou doest do quickly and no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him now the other one made it look like most of them all all of them knew because it said that one of you will betray me and then they said is it i master is it i it wasn't just peter laying his head and saying is it i there was uh, multiple disciples saying is it me and then judas said to 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 uh what was one and then was judas and judas said is it i master and Ju and Jesus said in the King James tongue, Thou hast said, which means in the Hebrew and Greek tongue and in the English tongue, what you just said is the truth. You said it, buddy. That's you. You're going to do it. Yup. Yup. Yes. Yes. You. <laughs> That's what it means. And then he told him after that, now go do it. Now go and do what, you, what you're planning on doing. And when he came to him later with a kiss, he said, you betrayed your master with a kiss. So, Judas at that point, so it didn't just take a Judas before this point to betray Jesus. Satan has to enter him. So, Satan entered him. And once Satan entered him, he became known as the son of perdition. He became known as the son of perdition. Pull up, pull up the scripture that says Judas is the son of perdition. According to Wikipedia, John chapter 17, verse 12. In John 17, 12, KJV, Jesus, in reference to Judas Iscariot, says that of all his disciples, none has been lost except the son of perdition. right here when I was with them in the world I kept them in thy name he's praying to, to his holy father those this is John 17 John 17 12 those that thou gavest me I have kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled So, 
the son of perdition is a name that was given to Judas. Why? Perdition in the scripture, it means ruin, loss, and it also means hell. From the Greek word that means hell, ruin and loss and mar, destruction. Son of destruction, son of ruin, son of perdition, descendant of. But he doesn't become the son of perdition until Satan enters him. Soon as Satan enters him, he becomes known as the son of perdition. So when God gave me the dream of Barack Obama and my mom handed me what's representing the body of Christ, breaking bread with me, the moment I gave that bread to Barack Obama, he took it and broke a piece of it and took it. And after I woke up from the dream, I admired him, thinking that he could be the next president, thinking that you know, because there was a lot of people up there that could be president. I think even Al, Al Witteson face was running again. Al Jarreau. No, Al Jarreau. Um, Al Bundy. <laughs> I think this uh, uh, Al Bundy. All these other Al's stuck in my head. What's his name? Y'all know. Al Sharpton. I think even he was running again at the time so he could get that pocketbook. He knows you can make money when you run, even if you lose. But, um... Yeah, there was a whole bunch of people running at the time. So I don't know who's going to be president. God is just showing me in a dream this man. And to me, when I first saw him on TV, and I kept seeing him on TV, I, re I remember telling my brother Howard, I don't know why, but every time I see him, and I wasn't, I wasn't joking either. I was being for real, and I wasn't being facetious. Every time I saw Barack Obama on TV, he looked like he had just risen from the dead. Not in a good way. He looked like he was a corpse. Or a living corpse. And I used to tell my brother that. I told him that. I said, he look. I said, I don't know why, but he always looks like to me like his lips are blue he's, and he's pale. It looks like he died. It looks like, it looks like he's dead. He's standing up there, but he's dead. You know? But I don't know why, but when I had the dream, I started to admire him. And God told me not to. And he said, I will tell you what the dream represents. For him breaking the bread, taking the bread from you. He represents Judas. And more over than that, Judah. And more over than that, the son of perdition. All of Judah. Judas betraying Jesus. Judas, born Judah. His birth name is Judah. Betraying Jesus. Double crossing. Double crossing like on that Oreo. Double, that, that Byzantine cross. And also, I'm sorry, Satanic Cross, which is both Byzantine and Satanic Cross, same thing. He said, Jesus, God told me that Barack Obama represented Judas in this dream. Judah, Judas' birth name, Judas' birth name was Judah. Judah, Satan entered Judah, a man named Judah specifically on purpose. He chose a man specifically named Judas to enter into because of his name. Because all Satan's intent was to get all of Judah because Jesus would be going on to be called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So his intention is to get all of Judah. His intention was and did and it and played it, it played out um, except for a small few to get all of Judah, the Jews, to betray the son of God to betray the son of man so he said he betrayed us the, the son of perdition betrayed the son of man double crossed him he double crossed him so every time the Byzantine Christianity priests when they waved that double cross it represents the double cross of Jesus how the son of perdition that runs these religions double cross Jesus through Judas they uh, the sons of ruin the sons of hell that's what they are the sons of ruin the sons of hell you can call them sons of anarchy sons of ruin sons of hell sons of perdition the descendants the son of perdition means descendant of ruin descendant of man of the descendants of ruin would be the enemies of the of son, the son of God. I mean, the son of man, 
meaning the, the descendant of humanity. So all of the sons of ruin, all of the sons of perdition, all of the sons of hell are really the enemies of the sons of humanity. But yet they get humans to betray other humans to join up with them and the son of perdition spirit enters into certain humans and they betray their fellow humans known as the sons of, of, of man, the sons of humanity. Jesus was the first son of humanity to be betrayed by another human being that was possessed with the devil. Judas was acting as the, in that moment, Judas was acting in, in the rank and authority and position of the Antichrist. In that moment, he was filled with Satan, which means he, yeah, his, he offered his body to become, he allowed his body to become a living vessel and host of Satan incarnate. Hence, the double cross, like the Byzantine and Satanic cross that you see up there, uh, Anton LaVey, see, Satan cross, did you see that? The difference between Anton LaVey and the priests over at the Byzantine Christ, Christian institution, no different. They might even hate each other in the flesh, but they're no different. They're being, they're being controlled and run by the same demons, you know. And most likely, they're actually behind closed doors, blood-drinking, flesh-eating brothers. Okay? And again, okay, so let's take it back to this. He, he called Judas, Judah, the son of perdition. Judah, the man that betrayed Jesus... He's not the only son of perdition. Every single person, every single Jew from the Ju tribe of Judah and any other tribe, they're all sons of perdition. They're all, every single one of them, even these black ones running around here talking about, I'm Judah, I'm Judah, I'm black, I'm Israel. Be careful what you're doing there because you're joining a clique of, in a, a regime, if you will, of disobedient satanic people that are, are being controlled and manipulated by demon spirits claiming to represent true Christianity through the through the guise of black Hebrew Israelite blah 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 Israel for Christ or whatever they're not they're changing their name to Israel Christ the sect of them to cover up to hide the, the, the past sins and hatreds and, and bigotry of the black Hebrew Israelites. Judah is a walking betrayal, a walking son of perdition against the son of man, Jesus Christ. They claim to represent Jesus Christ, but yet they preach more about their skin color, getting credit for black people's skin colors and getting, uh, getting credit for Jesus' black skin color. But yet that's proven that they do not know how to walk in the spirit. You are not a child, of, you are not an Israelite based upon, and a, a, a part of the New Jerusalem, based upon your, your natural, I mean your um, bloodline, your literal bloodline, if, if it, even if it is connected to the real Abraham, you're not. They don't believe, the black people, Israelites and people that run in their circles, they don't believe what they're reading in Galatians. Because Peter, Paul is making it very clear. He himself was a, was a Jew by bloodline related to Abraham. But he considered himself a Gentile, spiritually speaking, when he was against Jesus Christ. Okay? But now that he is in Jesus Christ, now Paul considered himself a Jew again. But a Jew is one inwardly. Not inwardly by blood, literal bloodline and DNA but inwardly by belief on Jesus Christ. This is what makes one a true Israelite, not bloodline DNA connected to the original Israels. And that's exactly, this is why every black Hebrew Israelite, in, in order to deny that, they're going to hopscotch all over the Bible to prove their point. 
And while they're doing that, they're, they're glorifying their flesh. It's more, their, their gospel is more about defending them and their black skin and their bloodline, so-called, to the original Jews, than it is about preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. There is no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female. We're all one in Jesus. That does not happen when we get to heaven. That's now. Jesus already accomplished that. Okay, so as at, uh, on in in earth as it is in heaven. Now, to, to answer the question real quickly, can women lead? Can women preach? Can women pastor? Can women shepherd? That question has already been answered by all of the great grandmas and grandmas and moms that have not just literally fed their children, but fed their husbands and children, their husbands that didn't know how to read. Some wives taught their husbands how, how to read the Bible. You know, they taught them the word. They taught them the words from the Bible. Okay. But that taught their families. They taught their families, men included, teaching men included, spiritual things that God had them tell tell to, to tell them, like teaching their their children about. Living right in living right uh, Christian life, reminding their husbands, by virtue of the authority of the Holy Spirit in them, to live an upstanding life with God. And he has to submit to that, because Paul, even in his letter, he didn't just say wives submit. He opened that up by saying, "Submit you one to another, be subject, be subject one to another." Coming from the same Greek word, where we get the word submit. Husbands and wives, submit you one to another. Be subject one to another. Be subject and submit are the same thing. So it behooved that husband to be subject to his wife. Paul said that. Okay, so again, it's, it has nothing to do with this all this modern day uh, Christianity and pulpits and stuff like that coming out of Rome. It has something to do with the, the original church from the book of Acts. There's no longer Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul's opinion to Timothy was, I would not have it. That's why he said, I. I would not have it that woman should usurp authority over a man. That's Paul's opinion or either someone added that to make it seem like Paul said that. But even if Paul said it, he'd be wrong. He'd be wrong. Paul also said about marriage. I say to you this. Not, and he said these exact words. Not the Holy Spirit, but I, Paul, say to you. And then after that he said, but now the Holy Spirit would say to you. So Paul is being allowed to give his opinions in his letters. Mixed in with the Holy Spirit. Advice. Whose advice are you going to take? You think the Bible is infallible now? It's not. Because Paul's not infallible. And then when Paul's making it very clear, I, meaning when I say I, I'm telling you I. It's my opinion. He gave his opinion to Timothy. I would not have it that a woman should usurp authority. But if Paul would have remembered what the disciples were taught, they were taught you were supposed to be servants of each other and not leaders of each other. That's what Jesus said. The rulers of the Gentiles hold cheapest. Be, are cheapest over each other, meaning holding lordship, rank, and are leaders of each other. He said, so shall it not be among you. You shall be servants of each other. Marriage does not negate that. A wife is her husband's servant, and a husband is his wife's servant. Said that right? A wife is her husband's servant, and a, and a husband is his wife's servant, and a mother and father are their children's servant, and the children are their husband and wife, mother and father's servant. It's all equal. Everybody caring for each other and taking care of each other in the midst of the, the, the true biblical nuclear family. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. And so in heaven, uh, uh, our Father which art in heaven was changed by a feminist movement. Now it's just not just a feminist movement, it's an occult, satanic movement 
called the New Age Movement by Mary, uh, pushed through Mary Baker Eady, but also practiced by the Sufi Muslims, but also and prayed by the Sufi Muslims, but also preached these days by T.D. Jakes. Our Father, which art in heaven, is changed to our Father Mother of the cosmos. Okay, so the real one goes, Our Father, which art in heaven, how will be our name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven, I mean on earth, as it is in heaven. If all women and men are brothers and sisters equally in heaven, because they're not married there, by the way, technically, then if a man, a Christian man, marry a Christian woman, that is not just his wife, it is his sister in Christ. And by virtue of that being his sister in Christ, and that, uh, her brother in Christ, they are to equally serve each other on heaven as it is on earth. In heaven, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, both male and female, one in Christ Jesus, in the same throne of equal power. Don't tell me that the word head of the wife means head meaning overlord, rank, position. No, it does not. They're misconstruing. There's another meaning that word head can mean that in some other circles, some other you know, platforms. But what Jesus is saying is, when the translator turns it the word to head of the wife, instead of the original Greek word, which implies head meaning, it says, as Christ is the head of the church. In which way? That he loves her, willing to provide for her, would die for her, protect her. That's it. You're not her boss. You're not, you're not her boss, you're not her Lord, and, 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 when it come, and it does not say in the scripture that she cannot teach or pastor. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense, okay? The reality is you cannot say that women cannot pastor nobody. If you, if you as a man, when you were a teenager or a boy, have been taught by your mother or your grandmother the scriptures, you've been spiritually fed by a woman. You've been fed means you've been pastored. You've been shepherded. You think they're going to get in trouble at Judgment Day for shepherding you, which led to your ultimate salvation? After you maybe ran amok as a teenager, but the seed brought you back to Christ that they planted in you? You think that they're going to be judged for that? No, they're going to be rewarded for that. Because the Holy Spirit in them pastored you, and they pastored some of their husbands that need it to be submissive to what they know in Christ. Everyone has a psalm and a hymn and a word from God when it comes to spiritual fellowship within the church. Marriage between a husband and wife does not negate that. There's so much chauvinism in the Bible that modern day chauvinistic men that the one that meant is chauvinistic gravitate to. And chauvinistic men are the ones that translated it into the Bible to control. But also, that they will be pour the fuel, the fuel on the fire of the extreme opposite. Of women all of a sudden just going crazy, you know. They're becoming like the, chauvin the new chauvinistic men, you know. Treat men like crap and usurping authority like crazy. You know, neither is good. Neither is God. God's will. And then, that's why you got the back and forth. Chauvinistic men versus chauvinistic women. <laughs> but neither of these forces are being led by the Holy Spirit. Because there would be a unity between them if it was. If there would be a unity between them. There would be... Because it says we're all one in Christ Jesus. That means that we have all things common. Women are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In his throne. Equally with men. Again. We don't believe in as above so below. Uh, the demon version. Which is a counterfeit version of. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? 
Let's move forward. Because now we're talking about the son of perdition. The son of perdition. Don't talk to me about the black Hebrew Israelites. Don't talk to me about Judah, them being Judah, because Judah betrayed Jesus. And the black Hebrew Israelites are betraying Jesus Christ and stabbing him in the back every day, pretending to represent him or thinking that they do. They represent their culture, their bloodline, their DNA, they think. Their Israeli DNA. Israel is cursed. Jerusalem on this earth, earth-bound Jerusalem, earth, flesh, blood, DNA Jerusalem is cursed. She is called Mount Sinai. Read the very end of Galatian letter. She is called Mount Sinai. She is cursed with a curse. She is, a, she is the son of the bond woman. The woman in bondage. That's why she's talking about Sabbath, keep the law. She's the curse. She's cursed. She, he is cursed. He is, he is the son of the bond woman. Okay? The son of the free woman is free and walking in the liberty through the Holy Spirit. They, these are the ones that believe on Jesus Christ. These are ones that are heirs of Christ. And they are also known as spiritual Israel. Which the words not in the Bible per se. But it's there. In so many words by the words New Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is from up above. Is spiritual Israel. It's made up of every tribe of people on this planet. Every bloodline of people on this planet that believe. That Jesus Christ is son of, son of God and Lord of Lords. That believed the gospel of Jesus Christ and got born again and made anew on the inside. But yet the, the natural bloodline is, is connected to some other natural tribe. But the spiritual bloodline is they are grafted in as being Israel. As being a spiritual Israel or metaphoric is terminology for Israel. They are. Let's go back to the betrayal. The Oreo cookie you're looking at, the symbol, the symbol, symbol uh, symbolic, the symbol, the double cross, is really representing, it's a, it's a Byzantine symbol, but it, it is a Church of Satan symbol. And it represents, and somebody's going to say, but the Church of Satan symbol has, um, has the, 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 eight, the number eight that lays down, it's called the infinity sign. It is the Ouroboros. It is the serpent eating his own tail. Okay? Connected to the Byzantine cross. They're going to say that's the, that's the symbol for, for Anton LaVey's, you know, the pastor of the Satanic Church, the open Satanic Church. That's their symbol. Right? But the circle there connected to that Byzantine double cross. Backstab, antenna looking cross, is the circle that around around the word Oreo. That is an Ouroboros. Ouroboros is twofold. Ouroboros is shaped like the number eight laying down, a serpent like eating its tail, and it is a, a circle as well. It both represents infinity. Okay, let me give you that. Let's go from this scripture. Judas is the son of perdition, right? Wait a minute. Judas is the son of perdition. But also, he's not just it's not just that Judas is the son of perdition. Son of perdition literally means This is what caused Judas helped Judas to betray. Oh, this is an old page. This is what helped Judas to betray, um, betray the Son of God and or the Son of Man. Twofold, and betraying the Son of Man, Jesus born first. He's betraying Jesus first as the Son of Man, the Son of, descendant of mankind, descendant, being descendant of Mary's womb, <clears throat> becoming human. But the spirit that is in Judas will go into into everyone else that put Jesus to death. So they're betraying 
they become they are betrayers all of them known as Judah are betraying Jesus okay a, a betray uh, a son of perdition is a betrayer of mankind is another human being filled with the devil betraying another human that is filled with Christ okay okay so let's open this because I got some other things here even the occult people pretend to be against Rome and the Jesuits Helena Petrovna Blavatsky a known occultist like Alistair Crawley openly did little statements against Rome but ambiguously it seems like she's for them and against them perhaps jealous I don't know that they held a high position in the occult and she does she made some statements here we'll get to that later but let's go here Let's make this big. Can we make this big? Here's one way to make it big. Download it. Open it up. To double cross. What does it mean to double cross? There's a double cross right there on an Oreo, and that's the uh, the aura bar. The circle is the aura bars. It is also in Catholic circles known as religious Catholic circles and Catholic leaks leaked into the minds of Protestantism <laughs> also represents the symbol for the the Apostle not the Apostle the Archbishop okay it's supposed to be the symbol for the Archbishop but it's also it is it's not it is the symbol of Satan this is uh, this is another variant form of the symbol, the Anton LaVey Church of Satan. It is the du Byzantine double cross, topped topping the Ouroboros, the symbol for infinity, which is depicted by a number eight laying down, but is also in the Church of Satan. But Rome has this um, the circle version of it for their to represent their archbishop uh, you know symbology what well, Rome always accuses the ch open church of Satan of stealing things from them like okay for instance the upside down cross in the church of Satan the, the Vatican says that the church of Satan perverted it they both still say it represents both the open church of Satan which is a beard and a cover-up disguise for the Roman Catholic priesthood really being the real priesthood of Satan. They both say that it represents Peter hanging upside down on a cross, being crucified. True Christian history doesn't have any proof that Peter was crucified upside down. That's Catholic stuff. That's Catholic. A Catholic made that up. Look in history. A Catholic person made that up. Okay, again. Or were they, or were they Jewish? It was a Catholic or Jews. I think it was Catholic that made that up. But, again, we progress. They both hold the upside down cross symbol. Symbolism. Both the open satanic church and the disguised satanic church. Meaning the Roman Catholic Vatican priesthood. They both have the upside down cross and the altar with the skeleton on it both both okay have a death's head a skeleton on the table on the altar with the when it comes to telling you how to as a catholic priest or bishop how to set up your prayer chamber and how to you know deny yourself and uh, meditate and upon your own death by looking into the skull while you're praying contemplating on your own death 
they liked they liked the Maccabees, but the Maccabees, the base word for Maccabees is macabre, meaning fascinated or obsessed with death. Any the only thing that's obsessed obsessed with death is that which is dead spiritually and trying to get other people in the whole planet to be obsessed with that they're making even the priests that don't know any better what they're doing when they got that skeleton on their desk while they're praying and looking into it and meditating on it, they are channeling st the spirit of death okay now uh To double cross to this, uh, the the Ouroboros is the serpent eating its tail in a circle. It represents infinity. The Church of Satan, open Church of Satan, and the 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 Roman Catholic Church priesthood. The reason why they have so many similar things like the upside down cross and certain altars that they have the same with the skeleton on it. And the chalice right next to the skeleton and keep a book some book open next to it their bible versus the satanic bible it's because they're the same company one is open darkness all oh, hail satan in the open jesus warned satan the more trickier device of satan is to come as an angel of light satan doesn't deceive the whole world by revealing i am satan and it's obvious Satan deceives the whole world by saying, I am Christ. I represent Christ. I am the real church. We are real Christians. You know them by their fruits that they're not real Christian, though. Not a real Christian priesthood. For one, they look more like the Pharisees than anything. For two, idol worship. Three, idols to worship. For a cross does not represent victory, Jesus getting the victory, although he did. It represents the original cross symbology really represents. Jesus said, don't have no image, don't take none of these. Jesus in the Old Testament said in the Ten Commandments, don't take none of these. He said, don't have no graven images whatsoever. That includes the cross. The cross originally represented to the Romans. In the cross, in the sign of the cross, we have conquered. Not, not like Constantine said. In the sign, of, in his mother, in the sign of the cross, conquer. God told us. That's a lie, a fabricated lie. T.D. Jakes is preaching that. Constantine and his mother. Let me tell you something. They're hearing from the devil. The the cross, Satan said, to Constantine and his mother, and the early church Antonician fathers. The cross is a symbol, sim, symbolic of, we put it in the evil hearts, in the early Caesar's hearts, that the cross represents, in the sign of the cross, we have conquered Christ. We have defeated him. Because they believe that they, feed, they defeated Jesus. That's why they got their minions. And our day through the Word of Faith ministry, getting up there preaching that Jesus got defeated and got taken to hell and got beaten up for three days. They're satanic. They and when every time they talk about it, it's like you can see them salivating. You can see the it's like they're imagining it like they really wanted it to happen. And then they cover it up with like, oh, he broke free in Jesus' name. No, you're a liar. You're a pathetic Maccabee base word macabre, fascinated with death, obsessed with death, liar. It's what you are. Be your name Marilyn Hickey, Joyce Myers, Creflo Dollar, Rod Parsley. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, all of them, all of them that preach that, all of them, the popes, all of them. So, the cross originally represent what the makers of it said it represented. 
Yeah, we keep thinking that our religion that carries crosses around have always been in existence and God started it. No, our religion that, that taught us to carry crosses and have crosses and make crosses is a direct descendant and spinoff of Roman Catholicism in early Rome who for them to cross represent a place of of execution of satanic offering sacrifice so it doesn't matter whether it's up, right side up or upside down or burning on fire it represents the same thing you set it on fire it represents we are illuminated this this thing represents what it, it represents I don't care if the KKK put a, a cross on your yard and it wasn't burning that was a that was a threat from the Church of Satan that was a threat from uh, the satanic order known as the KKK that are the sons of the Vatican that was a threat from the Catholic Church as well I mean not Catholic Church but the sa Satan the demons that control all of these evil priests saying that this sign is a sign of intimidation we we waved it around, <clears throat> around in the AD times to make people afraid of being crucified on it so when we put it in your yard it has the same representation now when we light it up illumination Satan is fascinated with illumination it represents a flaming Lucifer that they sing to at the Vatican old oh, flaming Lucifer on Easter that that cross lit up in your yard burning represents a flaming threat the threat of death but who the light burning the fire burning on that is is representing the illuminated Satanists that are going to do it those the ones that are going to do it to you or threaten to do it uh, which are threatening to do it to you the torch of illumination the torch of the, of the Illuminati, the torch of illumination, that torch is the torch of Lucifer, which is now called Lucifer. But I mean, in Old Testament times, it was Satan was not called Lucifer. Okay, we we went over that in another segment. But, but nowadays, they got about it through the timeline. Satan created a religion and dubbed himself Lucifer, Morning Star, and and it's a Luciferian religion out there, and that torch represents the torch of the Luciferian light they will tell you out of circle Luciferians that it doesn't have nothing to do with worshiping the devil a demon spirit but in the end it they'll tell you the same thing that every Satanist doctrine will tell you the church of Satan has a doctrine for the outer circle Satanists that they teach them and it's the same thing that Oprah and Maya Angelou teaches about becoming and and, and Martin Luther King about becoming gods about becoming divine it's the same teaching it's illumination it's illumination right okay so the flaming cross represents Lucifer the Luciferian light the Luciferian the satanic light the false light Satan disguised as an angel of light we know them by their fruits they're not the Roman Catholic priests are not representing God the Father they don't all God the Son or Holy Spirit they hate Mary they really hate to tell the truth be known the Roman Catholic priests all of them except the ones in the outer circle that think that they love Mary they hate Mary's guts they hate her guts they hate the real Mary's guts who was born Miriam they hate her guts that's why they, Satan gave them a false Mary, which is really a, 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 a another version of an, of an Egyptian, earlier Egyptian female principality, you know, Isis, Neith, Neith and Isis, and a couple of other ones. Um, yeah. But back to the double cross. Judas called the son of perdition would double cross stab in the back double cross Jesus 
double cross sim symbology does not represent true Christianity. I don't care what they're saying at the Byzantine church. The early Byzantine church, even if they still exist, I don't know. But the early Byzantine church, uh, the priests are corrupt. They are the spin-offs. They are the, the, the children of the, the Roman Catholic Vatican. They are priesthood. They are, every single cross that they have represents basically a mockery of Jesus Christ. A mockery. And a badge that, that they wave around that says, we got the victory. Our demon principalities got the victory over the Christian God. Is what they are saying when they wave that around. They have it on our cookie, y'all. Look at our cookie. They got the Baphomet down there on the bottom. A symbolic for the Baphomet, right? They have the Ouroboros, that circle, and top by that thing that looks like a TV antenna, but it's really a, uh, it is a Byzantine and a Church of Satan cross. Okay? That's what it is. And I'm going to show you. Let me show you without just telling you. Let's read this. What I asked Google, right? What does it mean to double cross someone? Google states to cheat or deceive. Isn't that Judas? Isn't that what does even the spirit of the son of perdition does? Satan? Britannica Dictionary definition of double cross. <clears throat> Object. To cheat or deceive someone especially by doing something that is different from what you said you would do. I thought I could trust her, but she double-crossed me. So we're talking about a double-cross. Jesus Christ is being double-crossed every day by these religious people that keep these symbols. And these symbols represent the double-cross of Jesus Christ. The double crossing of Jesus Christ. They're stabbing him in the back every day. And, and they're trying to get true Christians to believe that Byzantine Christianity, Roman Catholic Christianity is real Christianity. And accept it as a norm, as Christianity and, and mingle together and praise God together and do ex great exploits together. But in reality, they are the world religion. They are the world religions. That's why they even call themselves the world religions. They are the world religions. They are, and Satan is the god of this world. And those are the world religions and their god is Satan. Satan, the, the feminine version of god of this world, meaning god of this earth, Satan. The feminine version of that is Gaia. There's a couple of feminine versions of that. Gaia, the spirit of the earth, the god of the earth. The god of the world, of this world, is uh, feminine, Gaia, masculine, Satan, <laughs> other feminine, the feminine of Lucifer, light bringer, is uh, Venus, goddess, goddess or deity, some say deity, of love. And yes, the false gospel of love, yeah, yeah, I seen the symbol at one of the one world religious events some years back with the with the Bible, I mean with the Gateway Church in Texas, you know, Robert Morrison, James and Betty Mo uh, Ro Robinson, uh Carrie Job singing on their stage. They had all the religions there. And the stage was shaped just like just like the symbol for Venus. Which is the symbol for Venus is the feminine. But this feminine spirit running and controlling the earth is co partners. I'm not going to give credit and say it's the feminine spirit running the whole planet. No, it is co partners to the masculine spirit running the earth. That masculine spirit, like that stage they were on at that event, was shaped like Venus. It's literally shaped like Venus, and in the middle, it had all kinds of pictures and 
uh, uh, CGI, what do you call it? They had uh, some type of technology where it looks like a movie screen and things were going on. And spear circles and all kinds of weirdness. Uh, what do you call it? Spirals and stuff. They do the same thing at the Super Bowl. Um, the masculine version of that symbol is called Lucifer. Satan. Yeah. Again, we progress. Gaia, the spirit of earth, is the feminine version of Satan, the god of this earth, the god of this world. The, the religions, the world religions, Catholic, Protestant, Episcopalian, meaning Episcopalian, Presbyterian, don't get insulted, get free, leave the religion. And only only pray at home and follow Jesus. The heads of those things, Anglican, all of them, they are they they may say that they are drinking blood and eating flesh figuratively when they do it with their fellow brothers at Rome at big events. While Rome is doing it literally and we don't want to argue with them about that no more. So God will sort it out in heaven, blah blah. No. They are drinking blood human human blood and drinking eating human flesh all of them even the ones that convinced themselves and convinced us to do it figuratively because they added to the scripture that jesus said do it or you can't have eternal life one day john chapter 6 which contradicts the other scripture that says you can't have eternal life now by just believing in me you don't have to do anything my cross paid it all what I did on, the, not my cross, but what I did on their cross that they killed me on when I offered my sacrifice, it paid it all. Now, why would I turn around and say, but you still got to do something in order to save your life? Drink flesh and eat blood, first thing. Mm, yeah, when you wake up, when you're waking up, I'm talking from a walking and steadily waken heart and mind you begin to realize it looks like tastes like smells like Satanism 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 cannibalism Hannibal Lecter cannibalism cannibalism is the dinner table of every trafficker Every in the know satanic trafficker on, on this earth right now. They're eating human flesh and drinking human blood. They're getting up through the world religions. They, they taught us to do it figuratively. And convince us, ourselves through the Catholic Church that it is literal. But it is all satanic. All of it. I'm not going to go back into what I, what I told said the other day. Jesus is not going to contradict the type and shadow Old Testament version of his blood which he said, do not eat it or else I will cut you off. He is not going to contradict that in the New Testament and say, well, you can eat it and drink it now. Because if you don't, you can't be a part of me. But how about this? Me spilling that blood for you on the cross, that covers it all. That pays it all. But yet, I don't think that it does pay it all. So you better drink that blood. Just figuratively for you. But for you, I want you to do it literally. But all be called the church, Protestant and Catholic. The earth's churches are the churches of Satan. Satan owns the 501c3 <laughs> storefronts, cathedrals, mansions, all of them. Now the people therein are born again, many of them. The ministers that, don't, even the ones that don't know no better, that's preaching false doctrines that are not directly wolves, that need to be saved before they die spiritually. And the Christians that follow them on a, on a, on a weekly basis. That's why when Corona, the disease happened, we were all made to stay home. They proved to us that they own the churches. The, the beasts of the planet, the rulers of the world, which is the beast of Revelation 13, 
first beast and second beast, they all prove to us that they, they control and they own the 501c3 churches and non-501c3 churches, C3 churches when they told you, stay home. And they even try to control you how you worship at home even. Don't have but so many people. That's just the beginning of sorrows, ladies and gentlemen. That's the, just the beginning of Satan showing his face through those individuals to show that they are the seat of Satan. And their head pastor is that Pope in Rome. Yeah, there's another Pope, a couple other Popes, I think, that belong to a different so-called apostolic succession of Paul or, or Andrew, Bartholomew. But they even, when they meet up with the Pope of Rome, with the other religions, Judeo religions and Muslim religions, when they all meet together in one place at the One World Tower, on, televised, they always put that Roman Catholic Pope right in the middle, signifying that he is a higher Pope than they are. And they know it. They know the rank in Rome, Italy, is higher than any other apostolic rank in this planet. They know that. They know that. Don't listen to Eben, Ebenard Jordan and all these other people like Carlton Pearson sitting down having communications, talking about praising the Vatican, basically, in apostolic succession and covering for every apostolic succession that there is saying we're not all the same apostolic succession no it is all the seed of satan all of it it is all a double cross they're all double crossing jesus christ on a daily basis and trying to get us to do it with them bye convincing ourselves that we can be the Bible is we have the Bible to teach us and Jesus to teach us and he was just trying to teach us in other words teach us for the reason of becoming gods and becoming divine that's not why the scriptures the scriptures that were inspired by God were inspired by God they were not inspired by God to teach us to become divine but to teach us to remember the testimonials of how to how to stay submissive and how to stay repentant and how to how to continue to obey Christ. Just as a reminder, a testimony, we get the re early reminders on our knees from the actual voice of God, but the scriptures is just a testimony of that reminder. They're trying to teach us, to, real Christians, to betray God every day, to double cross Him. What does double cross mean? Why are, you, why are they using one of their crosses as a double cross? Why is it on our Oreo cookie? Why is it on the Oreo cookie? I stopped eating Oreo cookies years ago when I found out there was the white stuff and it was nothing but lard. I was like, what? And the rest of it is just sugar. Lard and sugar. Now there's an appetizing thing that might help one make it to a right ripe old, old age or just the opposite they created it to kill us at an early age right yeah yeah we're not forced to keep the dietary laws in the bible no more but at the same time still healthy uh, again on this oreo we see we see the the byzantine and satanic cross double cross Okay, let's let's look at what's the next thing in my um because this is my yeah okay oh, I gotta no, that's, hey when that happens yeah I don't think it probably close up. it's that and then this one is the next one right here you gotta download open okay so what does the it, uh, double cross we just read what the double cross represents right what does uh, I asked Google what does the circle represent 
what does the circle represent in religious circles it represents the notion of totality wholeness hold on to that word wholeness because we're going somewhere remember wholeness they said Catholic means whole the whole universal right because they're, 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 they're playing with Greek and Hebrew words they're reassigning the elements of Hebrew words catalos in the in the, our Bible catalos in the Greek catalos meaning the whole it does not mean a religious organization it means the whole the one that was given credit for first calling the coming up with the word Catholic itself is they say Ignatius of Antioch and Ignatius of Antioch is reverenced and hallowed, hallowed uh, and venerated worshipped as a, an early church father an Antonician father this is another host of Satan on all earth yeah I don't care you can you can look at quotes from Ignatius and they sound just like what Jesus is saying it doesn't matter you know them by their fruits when they when you see that they're also representing universalism that is not the man of God that is not a true servant of God Ignatius is a uh, was into paganism as, as well as other church Antonician early fathers the real men that they say are early fathers like Paul and Peter they were not early fathers at all they were early brothers of ours called no man father they were told right and don't you don't you call each other that either right okay so as a religious title <clears throat> treat older men like fathers but don't call them father as a religious title and set up some type of spiritual significance to it right religion does that it tries to make everything spiritually significant well yeah Paul and Peter and them they would not have agreed with the Antonician fathers on any level okay so Ignatius of Antioch was given credit and is given credit by the Roman Catholic Church to this day for being the first one to coin the, the term Catholic but I mean to describe God's church right which is satanic because Jesus God never said that about he never said that the term originally catalos means the whole but in fullness when you look up in the Greek Bible it means the whole but in fullness it tells you both elements hollows meaning the whole and kata and kath k-a-t-h-c-a-t-h -A -A meaning down and down from related to kato kato and kato meaning underworld put under meaning put under related to kato meaning having to do with representing meaning representation of or having to do with uh, I'm trying to remember it the way it was in the Storm's Concordance it's, it's coming from a word that words that mean not in respect of but having to do with or in respect of means having to do with um, according to in accordance with Cato without the L-I-C lick Cato in the Bible means 
in accordance to. But the full meaning, when you break up the elements, it means according to what? According to the fallen. According to that which has fallen. According to that which is cast down. That's why a lot of Greek words in the Bible that have the word Catherine, not all of them, but a lot of Greek words in our Bible that have the word Kath in it and Kata in it, the definition will read something that has been put down, that has gone down, that is down, or that is under. Not above, but beneath. Oh, these organizations like the, the, the Roman Catholic organization leaders pride themselves in, in the glorious meanings of, of the titles of their organization. But then they lie and they only give part of a meaning. Respect of the whole is only part of the meaning of Catholic. And we, we did a whole study on this in our series called Roman Continuity. Looking up these words. The whole meaning of Catholic is in respect of the whole throwdown. That which has been taken from a higher and put down to a lower. That which has been put down. The whole, the hollows of that which has been cath or kata put down and or kato put under. That's what it means. And you know what? It represents fallen, a state of fallenness, a state of apost an apostate state. So when they call us anti Catholic, they want us to think it means you're against the Catholic people. No, what they really mean is that's an accusation, but what it really means is you are anti Catholic, meaning you are setting yourself up as true Christians, you're setting yourself up as the true universal church. But the, the true meaning of the word that even implies that they're trying to say that we are, we true, we true Christians are the real Catholic Church. We are the real, in other words, we are the real under. We are the real beneath. We are the real thing that is put down. That's what they, that every, that's, I know that's ambiguous, but that's everything Everything, every time they say that, that's what they mean. When they say, you are anti-Catholic, they are, through the dark art of ambiguity, they mean those three things. They mean, there's, on the surface, they mean, you are against Catholics. And that's not fair, because that's being bigoted. To make us out to look like bad guys, us Christians that preach against Catholicism, and warning Catholics and non-Catholics, come away from her. Two, anti-Catholic they by dark, dark art of their satanic ambiguous, ambiguous thoughts. When they say it, when they call us anti-Catholic, the second ambiguous meaning is you are an imposter universal church. Three, they, the, the more inner circle witches and warlocks that run the Catholic religion, they know that universal, they know that cat means fallen and thrown down. So they know they're accusing us of being anti-Catholic. Anti doesn't mean against in that, in that statement, in that line of, on that line of amb ambiguity. It literally means proxy for, replacement of, meaning you are standing proxy, in other words, we, the real church, Christians, non-Catholic Christians, are really being, in being called anti-Catholic, they're saying, you, the real Christian church, are standing proxy and have replaced, and there's a replacement for, or the ministers of that which is fallen and put down and beneath. You see how sneaky that is? Now that's microscope. For that third one, that's way down itty bitty on the micro on the microscopic lens. But the first two are the more obvious ones. The first two 
stealthy, ambiguous meanings of anti-Catholic. Everybody that holds the Antichrist spirit in their heart will accuse anybody that's called to expose the Antichrist to the church. They will accuse us of being anti-Catholic. They're trained to do that. It's in their minds. It's a spell that they need to be broken over them. That's double cross that you're looking at. Let me show you a picture if I got it. Did I ever send that picture through? Oh, but anyway, what does the circle represent? I asked Google in religious circles. It represents the, no, uh, the notion of totality, wholeness, universalism. That's why they said in the Catholic Church that circle with them two crosses represents the sign of the Archbishop. Wholeness, totality. It is the Ouroboros. It is actually the, the serpent eating its tail. Totality, wholeness, original perfection of the self. Sound familiar to some of those religions? The self, create a hope, you know, we are gods, you know, that's that false god doctrine. The infinite, no, the self is not infinite, the self is finite, it has an end. Infinite means it doesn't have an end. Finite, the corruptible has an end, but our spirit, if we have eternal life living in us, has no end unless we die spiritually and fall from grace. The infinite eternity, timelessness, all cyclic movement, God. See that? Your apostolic, your, 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 not apostolic, the archbishop symbol of the circle with the double cross. It actually means to double cross God. That's what it means. They said that it's, this is, it's a double cross. And that circle, that serpent eating the cell, that Ouroboros, it is called, represents infinity. In other words, something that's not finite, something that has an end, something that does not have an end. It is infinite. It's a circle. It keeps going and going and going. It represents eternity. It represents God. Timelessness. Right? All cyclic movement. It represents God, right? God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Of course, Hermes, this is Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah, another spiritualist. Okay, again, Hermes Trismegistus is like a god for Oprah, Maya Angelou, T.D. Jakes, and all these people in the Vatican. All these people that preach, that endorse the circle as being, the circle is just a shape that, that God creates all shapes, but they worship these things. They turn these things into symbols of worship and symbols of idolatry. That's why it's called the Ouroboros, the snake, the serpent eating his tail. They said it represents God. So in, in, in one sense, they're saying that all of the archbishops are gods and we're all becoming gods, especially those that bear that symbol, that carry that symbol, or that bear the symbol. In another sense, they're saying, they're mocking God because they're saying that God is double crossed. They're really double crossing the real God. 
that symbol that represents God for them is stabbed through with a double cross. See that? It's stabbed. It's got a stab in the head. Jesus Christ said, the head is stabbed. The head of it, the top of it, is stabbed through with a double cross on a rod. A double cross. So they're, they're openly in the sense admitting that they're double crossing God with that symbol. That is on the Oreo cookie. Look at the bottom of that of that God. That circle that represents God with the double cross. They say the Archbishop symbol. Look at the bottom of that of that circle. That's Baphomet. Yeah, right where my arm is, right here. Where I'm wiggling my arm, right there. That's Baphomet. Right there. See that where my finger is. That's Baphomet right there. That's another version of the Baphomet. That circle right there, they said represents infinity and God. And uh, inf infinity, which means, you know, endless. And But also represents the self, meaning, like Martin Luther King used to teach, we can all become divine. Jesus was here, just came to teach us how to become divine. He wasn't divine in that he had a special uh, relationship, uh, unified relationship with his father, like he didn't really come down from the father, but that he became one with the father through good works, you know, doing what they, the Catholic Church calls indulgence. Indulgence is money, but they also define hard works as indulgences, getting in to become, not just getting into heaven through good works but is indulgences but they it's also uh, indulgence for them means not just money indulgence but these days good deeds to buy one's way out of hell also to help you get out of hell quicker when you die, you know. They call it purgatory. And so, yeah. The um. The. Um. They're saying that, the purgatory. It. It. I mean the um. The symbolism. Of these things like that like circle right there infinity they're saying even that it represents the self like we can all become divine like Martin Luther King used to teach Jesus just came to teach us that like Martin Luther King and Gandhi taught the same thing they knew each other Gandhi and Martin Luther King senior and Martin Luther King jr. and Martin Luther King jr.'s mentor Howard Thurman and his mentor Rufus Jones they all knew each other personally and it's not that they just endorse they not they didn't just endorse uh they didn't just endorse that um nonviolence. They endorsed a false Jesus. They endorsed a Jesus that graduated into becoming divine. That's what they teach. Okay? Again, universal look at that. The circle is universal symbol. They say universal and Catholic and, e and ecumenical all mean the same thing. Undogmatic, unprejudiced, it all means the same thing they said. That's all the words that they use for that. All inclusive, like the gospel of inclusion. All inclusive, that's their gospel, the inclusive gospel. Everyone that's human uh, is made by God, the creator, so everyone is a child of God already. And that's why the, the Vatican does not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus preached and the disciples preached. Okay. Even if you ever hear any of the Antonici, Antonician early church fathers in their writings seemingly preaching Jesus Christ the only way, they are, you got to look at the, the fruits of their paganism that they mix with it. Okay. Again, the, the circle there 
is representing on that what they call that symbol there right there in Rome they call it the Archbishop symbol the circle with the double cross right but it is the Ouroboros it is it is the, um, the Ouroboros the eight laying down is the other version of the Ouroboros. That's the one that the Church of Satan uses with the double cross on it like this. Like that. Okay? Same thing. It represents the same thing. Okay, so again, that circle represents God, they said, uh, wholeness, perfection, in eternity, infinity, right? Let's look at this. Oh, that's not that's not real okay so let's close that out let's go to the actual open Google search and let's talk to Google and let's ask Google according to King James Bible online dot org John chapter 13 Bible options plus text size one now according to King James Bible online dot org let's shut her up for a minute and let's ask her something different What does the Ouroboros with the double cross represent? According to King James Bible Online.org, John chapter 13 Bible options, plus text size, one now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That's not, she's not answering right, that's not, and that's not how you spell Ouroboros. I'm going to have to do some typing here. I know I'm going to spell it wrong, but they're going to correct me. patriotical cross right the double cross is known as the patriotical cross as well and is well described in the Wik uh, in the Wikipedia article there's no point in reproducing more than the sample here the patriotical cross is a variant of the Christian cross the religious symbol of Christianity this is the Byzantine cross okay so one of the Byzantine cross so I asked what a circle I said what a, what a circle right did it ask the whole question Or a Boris. Still gonna go with that, okay? Let's look at the images. I got the the, the images should pop up. Everybody got the halo, right? What is an Ouroboros? Ouroboros. Okay. I pulled up some videos for you. What is the serpent eating its tail? That's how you spell it, Ouroboros. The Ouroboros, or Euroboros, is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. The Ouroboros entered Western tradition via ancient Egyptian iconography and the Greek magical tradition. The Greek it was adopted magical. as a symbol in Gnosticism and Hermeticism, and most notably in alchemy. Alchemy, Gnosticism, all of those, okay? 
um, adapted by them. So this Ouroboros, let's copy that, Ouroboros, that's just one of them. One, oh, that's one image of the Ouroboros. Okay, let's look at the other images. One shaped like a, the number eight. But that's sick. They got our snakes eat, swallowing this tail. Why would you do that to a, an innocent creature? Anyway, we progress. I was looking for, um, there it is right there. See that? The number eight. Or oh, the serpent in the form of, an, in shape like the number eight, eating his tail. Okay, Ouroboros. I'm looking for cartoon imagery here like this and they're giving me real snakes that's I mean that's just like this thing to not give me what I'm looking for when I need it okay Watch this. Here we go. Number eight shape. See that? It's the same one we looked at before, though. Ouroboros. Ouroboros, see that? Serpent eating his own tail, representing infinity. Ouroboros meaning. The occult background of of uh, chemistry, really alchemistry, all chemical, al alchemy, right? Um, people have as a tattoo. Let's look it up under all. Euroboros. Euroboros or Ouroboros. A circular symbol depicting a snake or less commonly a dragon swallowing its tail as an emblem of wholeness see that of wholeness and infinity see that that symbol right there it says they said it represents wholeness and infinity it is Ouroboros, it is a circle representing an Ouroboros on a double cross, right? The Ouroboros, Ouroboros. The, the, um, it has the circular version, as we saw, and it has the number 8 version standing up and the number 8 version laying down, as we saw also, right? Tail Devourer. Ouroboros, coming from Euroboros, derives from the Greek word meaning tail devourer. Well, the word is not attested in English until the 1940s. The concept of the um, Ouroboros is very ancient. So the, the um, it was around in Catholicism amongst Rome even before they coined the term Ouroboros that much means they called it something most likely else um, but um, used across many cultures as a symbol of cosmic harmony eternity and cycle of birth and death okay um, cycle of birth and death. T 
tail devourer. But it's depicted with a, with a serpent or a dragon. Birth and death. Okay. Now, now let's look at that. See that it's, it's got the circle version of it. Okay. Now, we looked at the meanings of that, right? Here is the cyclic model. A cyclic model or a oscillating oscillating model is any several cosmological models in which the universe follows infinite and indefinite self-sustaining cycles. For example, the oscillating universe theory briefly considered by Albert Einstein in the 1930 theorized a universe following an, et uh, an eternal series of oscillating oscillations and I don't know we read the rest of that it's necessary <clears throat> just taking a look at oscillation um, what they mean by Ouroboros and cycling cyclical uh, cyclic I said cyclical I, I got that from the a Roman terminology from the Vatican the cyclical the Vatican what is the Vatican cyclical anyway what does the term cyclical mean in the Vatican And they call it the encyclical origin of circular letter sent to all the churches. So they, yeah, in having something called an encyclical, they fully endorse, you know, this thing about. Ouroboros in infinity which means they really think that their world is forever you know and their church is forever that's why they call it the universal church that's why they call it the Catholic church or the universal church because they believe Satan has deceived them into believing that they are forever they are perpetual and that they, when they eat human blood and drink human flesh, they are born, reborn and recast and revamped and re-risen in some other younger vessel, you know. And that it'll, the blood of the youth, human youth, will make them live longer. They believe in even transferring their spirits into younger people. You know that they believe that. They, they they did that. They pulled that on us in the X-Men movie. You know? Transferring, Professor X transferring himself into somebody else's body when he got killed. Into somebody's body that didn't need their body no more or something. Some coma guy. You know, that was brain dead. Nineteen thirty theorized a universal following a universe following an eternal series of oscillations each beginning with a big bang and ending with a big crunch They take advantage of God's creation. If God created the galaxy, and they want to call it the universe, <clears throat> they can say the earth is round all they want to. The flat earthers can say it's not round, it's flat. It's still round. It's flat round if it's round flat. It's still got it as round because it's flat or round. I don't care. But it's not a, it's not a round ball, you see. That's problematic. That's problematic. Clearly. 
those people don't know that hell is in the is in the core of the earth the lake of fire is at the core of the earth and in order for that to happen the earth would have to be a ball a globe can't be flat okay so yeah whatever but these people worship things that are going in circles they worship the isolating circle they worship it's their god they made a god the earth is a god to these people every planet is a god to these people because they're all round you know they think the human life the human life exists in the same way that is like an ouroboros like a like a like life and death when it dies it comes back alive again and keeps going back for like a like a almost like a reincarnation type thing that's what they're insane when they think they're gonna live forever only those with eternal life can live forever we think we only those with eternal life some of this stuff can be said of those with eternal life see but it's not a circle like go around come around because once we leave these bodies and go to heaven and once after, even after the rapture after all of that guess what happens it's not going to start over and we're going to find ourselves being born and John's back again in another 1970 or you know that was like the first one and it just went full circle and I came back around I get to do all over again don't even remember the first time around it doesn't work like that but if you go by what they're, they're theorizing, you know, it, you can almost say it's like a a a, a type of um, reincarnation, you know, where you can be you again, come back as you again, and do it all over. Or where your life forms and uh, this world just keeps going and you just keep being reincarnated in this globe like it's never going to end. Like it's not going in the fire. Oh, it's going in the fire. See, everything that has a beginning has an end, Neo. Everything that has a beginning has an end. Even the circle that appear, appears to have no beginning and no end has a beginning the whole thing was created was imagined and created by God the circle, the triangle, the square, the rectangle I don't know why they keep using the circle you could use almost any shape because they're all connected I mean What's the perfect circle? It has no ending. Neither does a triangle. Neither does a rectangle. You just got to turn that corner. <laughs> That's all. It still doesn't have an end. In other words, it has no end meaning. It keeps going. It keeps going. Well, it has an end. It each just has four ends. No, it has four edges. But it doesn't have an end. It doesn't. A, 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 a square doesn't end. It keeps going. It's infinity. It does. It, this is infinity. You just got to keep turning to get there. You got to turn the corner to get there. You got to go left, 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 or right, 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 right. With a circle, you just go left or right. With a square rectangle, you just go left, 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 or right, right, right. But you still, it's infinity. Right? With a triangle, you go down, left, right, up, down, left, right, up, or down, right, left, up, but it keeps going, still, it's still, any one of those shapes can represent infinity, but they for some reason like to choose a circle, whatever. You know, they like, they, uh, the occult love the triangles too. They love the triangles. Specifically the, the isosceles or whatever, or the uh, equal angular, triangular. The, the equal angular, triangular, 
triangle, also known as the equal angle and the triangular. It is um, because it is 60 degrees in measurement on all sides. In their occult numerology, zero sometimes has no value, so it is 666 on all sides, the way they measure their demonic world. Albert Einstein is Jewish, but Albert Einstein is also into some spiritualism, spiritualist stuff. You know, I believe even Albert Einstein probably even believes in the Big Bang Theory. So, there you have it. The circle is their God. Going in circles is their God. Okay? Our God is taking us up. He's not taking us in circles. He's letting us know in earth in the parameter of time what goes around comes around. There's nothing new under the sun. That's in Ecclesiastes, right? But as it concerns your life in Christ, it, it is to designed to move forward. Upward. Upward forward. Not downward. Not backwards. But forward and upward. Not in a circle. But up and forward. Right? So, um, let's look at that. What type of images they got for this? Ah, oh, circles within circles, and so the wheel within the wheel. Right? Okay, so let's go back. And get this symbol and we'll be almost done Anton LeVay Church of Satan double cross Anton LeVay according to Wikipedia the truth Anton about the Church Anton Vander Levy was an American author musician and Satanist he was the founder of the Church of Satan and the religion of Satanism Notice that's, oh, everybody knows that. Anytime the Antichrist makes themselves obviously known, <laughs> they, are, they are existing to mask the real, deadlier version of Satan and demons and Antichrist spirits. You know. Anything that is calling itself from God and, and, um, of God and God's will and but it's telling you to put poison in your body against your will take a mark against your will unless you won't be able to work whatever vaccination uh, or that is doing anything like that and and when you say call them the beast and the Antichrist and the mark the them of the mark anytime they say it, the opposite and say we're not that we're not that that's not the mark uh, we're not the Antichrist and this is not the beast those are exactly that they are in denial the the ones that come right out with the hell Satan stuff not that they're not really a part of Satan Satanism but they are but their job is to make it is to make it seem like the other is not you know unless you get somebody with a bitter mouth <laughs> Like Helena Bovosky, an occultist, that has seemingly a word to say against the Vatican, but at the same time condoning the Vatican, but also admitting that they practice, them and the Jesuits, they practice dark black magic, you know, and Anton LaVey even, acting like he's not in cahoots with the, um, they say there's, there's no real figureheads of the of the um, New Age movement, but there are. They're hidden. But they're in cahoots. Antelibate, Church of Satan is cahoots with the with the hidden figureheads of the uh, of the New Age movement religions. And uh, and even Anton LeBay made a statement against the New Age saying, Hey, give us our practices back and stop stealing from us. From the church stop stealing from the Church of Satan. One of those doctrines is that the New Age teaches that the Church of Satan teaches is that 
you know, everyone is divine or becoming divine. It's got the same thing, the same teaching at the end of the day. They're all Satanists, all of them. Okay, so yeah, every New Ager is a Satanist, whether they know it or not. They inadvertently, you know, a Satanist preaching the gospel of we're all gods. Come on, that's that's demonic teaching. That's the, that's the that's the satanic teaching in the Garden of Eden that caused man to fall. Okay, again, Anton LaVey, Church of Satan, in uh, Infernal Wisdom. Okay, let's look at the symbol because I asked it a question. See that the Baphomet? Okay, so the devil horns. Um, so the let's see if I put I, I, I typed in the word double cross so let's see if the image just has it it's on here somewhere there's the Baphomet there's the Baphomet on the cookie see at the bottom of the cookie that's the Baphomet see that right there that's the Baphomet that's the that is the Ouroboros circle and it has it also has the symbol of the eight the serpent laying its evening its tail laying down looking like the number eight laying down with that double cross on top of it right okay so you see the Baphomet there right Church of Satan right okay so Here it is right here. So here is Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan. Here is the symbol. The Ouroboros, we looked at that earlier, the eight, the Ouroboros, the uh, snake lane, uh, the, representing wholeness, universalism. It represents universalism, wholeness. Catholic, the Catholic, It. this is Catholic, y'all. This is wholeness. This is uh, the encyclical. But the cyclical gets its name because of the sickle, the, the cyclic, uh, the cyclic symbol, which represents infinity. They say wholeness, universalism, Catholic, Catholicism. Okay, same thing with the double cross. See that? That's the same thing over here. This is the circle version of it. The in, the infinite, infinity, right? with the double cross on top of it in Rome they said it, rep it represents the symbol for the Archbishop Byzantine Roman Catholic Christianity is is saying that it is the patriarchal sign for, right the patriarchal cross this here Here you see. I don't care about that. Here you see. Let me move out the way. The Ouroboros attached to the double cross. Here you see the Baphomet underneath of it, right? Which is symbolic for the Church of Satan. Here is the symbol symbol for the Church of Satan. The double cross. With the Ouroboros in the shape of an eight, infinity, it keeps going into infinity. It represents wholeness and universalism, Catholicism, right? Um, here is the symbol again, right here. That's a picture of Marilyn Manson with Anton LaVey. When Manson was a but young boy, a young lad. A lot of these people of uh, in, in their testimonies, they'll let you know, I used to be a Christian. Some Pentecost, some uh, evangelical, uh, you know, Protestant, some Catholic, you know. Uh, but then they join up with uh, Satanism and the Church of Satan. Yeah, even you see a picture with him up there throwing up the double horns with his brother, his satanic brother, Sammy Davis Jr. Yep. Sammy Davis Jr. was a member of the Church of Satan. 
Yep. Again, and a Freemason at that. They're free, um, I'm talking about inspiration, y'all. Yeah, y'all, with that one. So don't hang on that. You can hang on inspiration, but I'm just saying. I don't want to mislead anybody, but he's clearly a Freemason. By spiritual, natural, common, spiritual sense. He, uh, but he's a member of the Church of Satan in his living, Sammy Davis Jr. He doesn't, it didn't just meet up together and decided, two celebrities, let's take a picture. They always say that. Okay, again, here it is right here. This is a serpent right here, down here. You see the serpent down there? See the head of the serpent right here? Every time I put the thing on it, it messes it up. But down at the bottom of this symbol right here, where I got the thing, where the words keep popping up, that's the serpent's head. But that, even that's in the form of an eight. But uh, again, it's a, it is a um, infinity symbol, and there's a serpent up here too, pointing up and down as above, so below. Okay, alchemy, all chemical. That's the that's the symbolism, and this is right in the middle of it is the symbol that the Catholic Church says represents the Archbishop symbol. Okay, but they know, so again, out in the open, but they say it had the same meaning. They say it represents, both say that it represents, you know, infinity, universalism. There's a double cross in the, uh, being stabbed into the universe, y'all. They said it represents, that symbol represents God. But it's depicted really in that image is depicted by just a circle. But it is in in, in Catholic images is bigger than just a circle. But is it is that circle is representing a serpent eating his tail. Certain symbology. They said that circle represents God. But that cir that circle is a serpent being called God. Who is that? That's Lucifer. That's God. that's Satan. They're saying that it represents God. If they have the, the Catholic priest can say all they want to, that the Church of Satan, they always use the same excuse, is stealing our stuff and misrepresenting. No, they're not stealing your stuff. They are representing the way it's supposed to be represented. They're doing exactly what Satan leads them to do, to be the open Church of Satan. So that the Roman Catholic Church of Satan, <laughs> really, really, Roman Catholic organization and priesthood, can be that Satan that is disguised as ministers of righteousness, that serpent that disguises himself as God. And as ministers of righteousness, as an angel of light. So if we see the Church of Satan, we can say, oh, the Roman Catholic Church, they're the good ones. They're God and they're just mimicking them, right? But that's what the Roman Catholic priests always say about the open Church of Satan. They practice black magic, even the occult admit to that. Okay, let's look that up. So again... There's the symbolism there inside of a plaque. Here's another one right here with the Baphomet. Here's the Baphomet on top of, of the double cross, infinity, snake eating his tail, uh, God symbol, satanic God symbol. Okay, here is the Baphomet beneath the double cross infinity symbol see that okay it's the same thing here is the that's the that is the Baphomet goat right there that five point star is the Baphomet goat and it's and it's always found within the circumference of a circle or whatever they call it it's inside it's protected it's like protected by it's like 
and camped round about by another Ouroboros. By another serpent, by another. The circle around the around the Baphomet five point star represents infinity. It represents their God. And the fact that it represents the God self as well. In other words, every individual that takes a part of it and drinks the blood in it and eats flesh in it, they are becoming divine. They are becoming in, in eternal. That's counterfeit born again. Counterfeit born again because the only way to become, to receive eternal life is through being born again, believing on Christ Jesus. But they have their own version, see? And they, and they imprinted their version into our scriptures. Their way of doing things is through uh, becoming eternal is through works. You, become, you don't just become a member of the Catholic Church or the Church of Satan. You got to drink blood, drink human blood your way into it. You got to eat human flesh your way into it and continue to do that as a ritual if you want eternal life one day. If you want your life to continue in the circle an Ouroboros circle. You have to become a serpent like Satan and eat your own tail and keep going so that your life may continue to keep going. That's eternal life for them. Okay. You becoming to them, that circle represents God. You becoming the God yourself. It's lies. It's lies. All of it leads to hell. All of it leads to hell. This symbol here is another version of this symbol here. The Baphomet down here is another uh, symbol of this Baphomet right here. That's it right there, the Ouroboros. So now let's see what now that we've seen the Ouroboros here with the double cross and the Ouroboros here with the double cross and the Baphomet under it and the Baphomet over it, let's look at Helena, what Helena Blavatsky has to say about her, her leaders. Where you at, Helena? Let's pull you up. Is this Helena Blavatsky? Theosophy, that's it. She, like um, the other occultists, like Anton LaVey, named Alistair Crowley, where they get the, 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 the Uncle Festa character from. Alistair Cow Crowley and his Thelema religion, OCO occult that he created. Well, uh, with Helena Blavatsky, there's another thing. It's called Theosophy. Okay. What is Theosophy? What is Theosophy? What is the religion Theosophy? So let me read that to you with the reading version of these glasses. And not just the glass version of those. Theosophy, religion, Helena Blavatsky. Theosophy teaches that the purpose of human life is spiritual emancipation and claims that the human soul undergoes reincarnation. That's what that circle. Remember when we looked up the, the serpent eating his tail, the Ouroboros, it said it represents life and death, life to death, and the constant going around, around, around. Undergoes reincarnate, uh, uh, the soul undergoes reincarnation upon bodily death. 
according to the process of karma. It promotes values of universal brotherhood. So the symbol, the what they said that symbol in Rome represents the archbishop. The symbol represents universalism, they said, right? They're saying it is Ouroboros, it's universalism, wholeness. Wholeness, Ouroboros means wholeness, right? <clears throat> so does universal, and it means universalism. Okay, universalism, Catholicism. And the Catholics use it as, they said, as to represent Archbishop. No, they're lying. It is a satanic symbol. It represents, they believe that they can live forever. And the double cross on top of it is a double betrayal. It means, it means that they continue, they don't just betray Christ one time. They betray him more than once. It's a double cross. Okay? Again, a double stab in the back, a double cross. It is the continual, the continual stabbing in the back, the continual double crossing of Christ. Okay? Every time they get a Christian to become an atheist, and every time they get a Christian to become a Muslim, every time they get a Christian to become a Catholic, every time they get a Christian to become sympathetic to Catholicism as if it is real Christianity, a double cross. They have double cross Christ once again, and it keeps going round and round and round, okay? It says here, incarnation, reincarnation. It promotes values of universal brotherhood and social improvement, although it does not uh, stipulate particular ethical codes. Okay, so again, the symbol for that is the Ouroboros eating his tail. Let me send you this right now. And then we'll go back to that. I'm going to send this to you. Benny Hinn said that the snake watch <laughs> represents Christ the healer because he's teaching Vatican teachings that Jesus the serpent <laughs> from the book of Numbers. The serpent represents sin that Jesus was going to put on the cross. The serpent on the staff represents sin and Satan being put on the cross with Jesus. Okay. They keep forgetting Moses is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament, sort of. He's the one holding up the staff. How, how does the one holding up the staff represent the snake on the staff? As Moses held up the staff, <clears throat> lifted up the staff, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. At best, it's better to say that Jesus represents the staff himself, and the serpent represents, you know, the serpent, <laughs> the Satan and sin, but wrapped around the staff. Wrapped around Jesus, Jesus taking sin upon himself. Jesus the staff taking sin, the serpent upon himself, the sin of the world. Right? Putting it to death. Not becoming the serpent, but taking it upon him. The staff also, lifting up the staff also represents Jesus cross one day. He's going to put the serpent on the cross with him. That's not to snake watch. Watch. It represents Benny Hen. Sinny Hen. It represents the Christ our healer. Hallelujah. Because all of the hospitals use this as a symbol. That all of the hospitals are have that Buddha, Nihustin, even uh, 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 Janice and Jane Breeze symbol of the serpent, one serpent or the two serpents sometimes going up around the staff of God. 
it is not it is not symbolic of Jesus the healer it is symbolic of Satan coming up the, the staff to eat the offering on top of the altar of the staff which is usually a pine represented by a pine cone an all-seeing eye representing a third eye or mind's eye wisdom to be eaten by the serpent to make the serpent more wiser than the serpent and, and or serpents are this is Catholic and New Age theology and they believe it's good the ones on the outer circle satanic this is cannibalism all up in there this you know tapping into the spirit realm illegally through some third eye thing because they could say it was the mind's eye no metaphorically you could say the mind the mind's eye or the thoughts in the visions the thoughts in the mind that we can I can think of a hamburger right now you could call that the vision of my mind the vision of my thoughts the eyes what the eye what do the eyes of my mind choose to see in that moment a hamburger that has nothing to do with meditating and crossing over to the spirit realm to stop it stop it okay it's devil worship it's trans it, it is channeling demon spirits okay I'm, I'm saying that because I'm seeing it all over false Christianity all on Facebook it's being overwritten with TikTok satanic things on TikTok and horrors and, and demon worshippers and all kinds of stuff TikTok, TikTok, tick videos of police beating up people it exposes the cops but at the same time it leads with depression out of where you know all those videos um, it's good for getting the word out but be careful not to fall into a vacuum of watching those videos of even police so called getting their just desserts by catching them on video because it's a it's just an over proliferation of all these types of videos on Facebook and on, on social media it's just it's drowning out the preaching of the gospel and it's unnerving okay it's unnerving which means I just need maybe need to do more videos or something but yeah and it's got a lot of I'm walking to the mailbox in front of the mailbox. One of my neighbors are over there. Hey, I'm preaching on his balcony to somebody on his phone. It's not Christianity. It's Black Hebrew Israelitism. A lot of black brother, black brothers and sisters, black brothers and black sisters. A lot of black people. You'd be surprised. Let me talk about the brown people. A lot of brown people called black people. You'd be surprised. Christianity is not winning. They are they are being won over by paganism, false Christianity, African ancestry, witchcraft, New Age meditations. All of it related. It's all it's all the same, but it's just called by different names: Santeria, Voodoo, Hoodoo, and it all co covers us up in this, this Christianity. See. It's Christianity. It's like we got to step up as Christians and step up our, not game, but step up our seriousness and truly continue to get this gospel out and let them know, let them know yours is not Christianity. Black Hebrew, Black Hebrew Israelitism, you can call it Israel for Christ all you want to. That is not Christianity. That is false Christianity. It glorifies the flesh. Spiritism, African divination, Yoruba priesthood, pouring libations, calling on ancestors, all of that, and do, burning candles, witchcraft. My loved one died on this corner. Okay, say a prayer, say a memorial prayer, release some balloons. You start setting up candles and shrines. You you you're blatantly ignoring the the origin of that those are those that's oh, those are witches altars the people that set them up don't know no better they think it's they've been taught that it's a memorial for their dead loved ones because 
you know, and, and it channels and it even goes as far to teach them you can even channel their spirits on certain times of the year. Put them in the ground and in the grave and come visit their grave. Like everybody else. But when you start making those things with candles, be careful. Christians that do it, they don't mean no harm. They think they mean well because they don't know the origin of it. But the origin of those things off the side of the highway are those are witchcraft swines, whether the person meant it for that reason or not. Witchcraft altars. Okay? To channel the, the dead loved one, to have, a, you know, the candles to represent the channel. That's not why I do it now. I'll rebuke that in Jesus' name, then don't do it no more. Take it down, kick it over, knock it over, because it, it, you don't have it. And you don't, Jesus and the disciples don't do stuff like that. The pagans do it. The, we're, the Christians were disciples of Christ. The student does what the teacher does, right? Our teacher does not endorse putting up shrines with candles and calling it memorial on the side of the road because this is where they died. Where's their body? In the grave. Where's their spirit right now? In heaven or the other place. Okay. So, what's the point of that? It's from remembering them. It's what they told you. But but in reality, you have just become the the head witch of that altar without even realizing it, even if you're a Christian. There's no way around that. And you know what? But yeah, no, there is a way around it. Just admitting that that it, that it is what it is, and I'm not turning back to that. I'm I might go kick it down and knock it down. Now that I know and understand that it is a witch's altar, and I'll never do it again. That's the way around it. Is to get rid of it. Theosophy, religion. Theosophy teaches that the purpose of of human life is spiritual emancipation, and claims that the human soul undergoes reincarnation upon bodily death according to the process of karma. It promotes values of universal brotherhood and oh I said I was going to send it to you which I just did. This Theosophy. There it is right there. I'm down on the bottom. It says it promotes values of universal brotherhood and so and social improvement. All, all through, although it does not stipulate particular ethical codes. See the symbol right there. The um. It is the serpent eating his tail, with uh what they call the Jewish star of David. David don't got no stars. Jesus told the, the Jews in those days, you worship, you worship, he said, you worship, he said, your fathers worship the stars. He said, your fathers, your fathers worship all the hosts of heaven. He was talking about demons and he was talking about the, the physical planets and stars in the sky. So it's no marvel that years later, by, by the time we're born in the planet, the Jewish religion that doesn't believe in Jesus has all kinds of symbols like stars to represent something holy and sacred to them because they worship the stars. Their fathers worship the stars and they do it too. The star is a satanic star. It is a satan it's got Satan going around it. That's and, and every police department has this star and or the five point the the, the um Baphomet star. Okay? And that's who they that's who they're working for. Alright? This has as you can see right there, the symbol of the Baphomet. It is the um or I mean symbol of the Ouroboros. <clears throat> now I can't make that oh, that's gonna pixelate. So if I do this and let's go back to Ouroboros meaning? No. No, 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 no. In Taliban? No. Theosophy. Theosophy, right? And 
Theosophy, right? Let's take it up on the web, right? And Theosophy. Theosophy. Any any number of uh, philosophies maintaining that the knowledge of God may be achieved through spiritual et, uh, esc spiritual what ecstasy ec ecstasy I don't know uh, direct intuition or Sp uh, spiritual, oh, special, oh, it's not spiritual, or special individual relations. Be careful because they're trying to fuse true Christianity in that. It's counterfeit because part of that's true. Our God is contacted that way, but they they con con they contact their God, Satan, the God of the world, the same way, especially the movement founded in 1875 as the Theosophical Society by Helena Blavatsky, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and Henry Still Al Alcott, another occultist, right? Theosophy. Let's look at this. So we can bring that symbol up. There it is right there. Theosophy symbol. You see it's got the unk in the middle of it. Had a lady tell me, this is the unk, that's the real Christian cross, really. Christians, real Christians don't have no cross. The cross is where they kill us, okay? Again, that's a place of torture and, and, and divide. And see how much we love the cross when they go back to crucifying us to put us to death for the cause of Christ. Let's see how much they love us then. Let's see how much we love the, the cross that we're wearing around our neck then. This up here, this represents victory. No, it doesn't. Yeah, Christ already got the victory over that thing that they murdered him on. Okay, again, it's got the, the Nazi thing here, which is actually predates the Nazi. They say back in the day that the swastika, the spinning vortex, represents um, peace. Even before the Nazis get it, they say, to to justify the Nazis having it. But in, in, in actuality, the, the, the Nazi symbol is a spinning vortex. It represents a portal. It also represents the Hindu chakras, like the women wearing their heads, the portal, the crystal, representing a portal to to a um into the spirit realm. To the, to the spirit plane this is representing that the spinning vortex it represents uh, an open door to the spirit realm okay uh, here is um, this is representing Teo I think this is the Teo if I'm not mistaken I believe that this is the Teo religion for the for the religion called Teo. It looks like the Teo religion symbol. Um, here's the snake in the tail, the Ouroboros. Here's the Ankh, the African cross, or whatever. Here is the so-called Jewish Star of David, which is really uh, a satanic symbol, right? There is no religion higher than the truth. And that's their theory of the theosophy. Now, with that, let's go back. Here's the first one. There is no religion higher than truth. So again, there's all kinds of occult symbology here. 
Theo, Theos is Greek for God. It's a Greek terminology that, that represents the God of heaven, Yahweh. But in this lower case, it represents earth judges and lower case angels. Lower case G, angel, gods, angels. Theos. Satan is the Theos of this world, of the earth. Theosophy is the study of the God of this world is the religion of the god of this world they're saying like they're against religion but no no, no. they they are a religion they are an occult religion it is called theosophy okay and we saw the the meaning of that okay so again a number of philosophies maintaining the knowledge of god but their knowledge is the knowledge of the God of this world. All right. So again, in that symbol, we saw infinity. What they said represents God anyway. The circle, the snake in itself represents. They're saying this circle represents God. Saying this, they're saying the serpent is God. Okay. Even Rome depicts that the circle is God represents God, and that Jesus is the serpent that heals and Satan is the serpent that kills and then they depict that Satan and Jesus are the same person and Lucifer and God and, and Lucifer is a good guy and, and there's no difference really in Roman Catholicism there's no difference between Lucifer and Jesus Christ so <clears throat> they praise uh, say, the serpent Satan as the Holy Spirit they call him the Holy Spirit they call him Logos Okay, let's go back and we'll get, let's see if we can go back and get where we was before. I'll probably go back to Theosophy, this Theosophy. Okay, the Jesuits, Theosophy, the Jesuits and Roman Catholic Church. Let's get a little bit of Helena Blavatsky's thoughts here. Let's scroll down and specifically get this thought right here. The Jesuits have practiced not only occultism, because she's an occultism, an occult, an occultist practicing occultism. She's a Satanist. Uh, she wouldn't believe herself. She wouldn't openly believe herself to be eating humans and drinking humans, but they do it. You know. Uh, the Jesuits have practiced not only occultism, but black magic in its worst form. Now, why would somebody practicing black magic talk down on black magic, but still do it? See, satanic. It's a, it's a, you know it's like the pot calling the kettle black on purpose. She's sided by Satan to talk against her leaders. The um, people that are just as dark and even on higher levels in in the occult practice than she is. Um. And by the way. Helena Blavatsky is Hitler's favorite author. Again, um, and the Vatican is his favorite church, favorite priesthood. Again, the worst uh, practice black, but black magic practice black magic in its worst form, more than any body of men. And to it, they owe a large measure. Oh, and, and to it, they owe a large measure their power and influence. H. P. Blavatsky, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, uh, Theosophy or Jesuits article. The Society of the Jesuits, of course, uh, was founded to remedy the glaring evils. Of Christianity see that that lets us know that she's not any statement up there that makes it look like she's against Rome and against the Jesuits this statement here that st last statement reads is like she's just jealous that she's not as can't be as high as they are as far as what I can see practicing black magic on their level she can only practice it on her level but um again 
Yaha Transcendental Level. But this statement here by Helena Petrovna Blavatsky makes it very clear that she hates Christianity just like the Jesuits do, just like the Roman Catholic does, the Roman Catholic priesthood does. Pope Francis is not the first Jesuit priest like they advertise. Every priest has been a Jesuit. Even before the term Jesuitity comes along, they are Jesuits. Okay? Just by the meaning of the word itself. Okay, so they're formed in 1540, somewhere around there. They formed a group. They decide to form the group around 1538, 1537, 1538, but they did not push it through to 1540, 1541, to put it in the public view. But they always existed, always, even before they decided to name it Jesuit. And of course they're going to give Ignatius up of, of uh, Antioch, not, not Ignatius, Antioch, that's a different Ignatius. Of course, uh, of, I, of Iola, Ignatius of Iola, they're going to give him the credit because they always have to give some one person the credit for starting another sect or another cult within the Vatican. They have to, of course, there has to be one fall guy giving the credit for starting that. But he's just the face of it. Like the, the all of the people they mentioned that started Black Lives Matter, those are just the faces. And they're witches, practicing witches, obviously. Doing seances, calling on names, calling the name Ashe, which is witchcraft chantings, you know, African witchcraft chantings, and doing calling back spirits. Those are just the faces, but those faces are witches and warlocks, okay, of these things. So Ignatius of, I, of Leola is just another satanic face that they gave credit to starting the Jesuits. Now, don't go look in the history, my words verbatim, because that's why it's called a cult. Okay? They hit that. But you know them by their fruit, and you know them by their constant. What goes around comes around with these guys. They, they, there's nothing new under the sun with these guys. It goes, they, um, you know, they keep re redoing themselves, you know, redoing the, do, doing the same thing from generation and century to cent generation to century from century to century and generation to generation so ignatius of the of leola he's given credit for being the face for being actually the one that started the society of jesus known as the jesuits but he's just the face there are demonic principalities behind him and there are higher forces in rome in the vatican behind him and this is all created by them okay by it's all created by them and he's basically Ignatius of Leola is basically a puppet for Rome he's given credit for starting the Jesuits but even before it was called Jesuitity in the society of Jesus Rome was pretending to be a society for Jesus before, while they were killing innocent, killing Christians, killing innocent Jews and innocent Muslims and innocent Catholics, burning them at the stake, hanging them from crosses, doing all kinds of crazy stuff to them with their every, every inquisition that they keep coming up with. Okay, and that's the reality. But he, from Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's insight as an occultist herself in the mix with them she says the society no, no other words known as the society of jesus called the jesuits was founded to remedy to be the cure bringing into the glaring evils of christianity what does he mean by that? Ignatius of Leola, he founded it so he can end all the evils that was going on in the Catholic Church? No. The Ignatius of Leola was given credit for founding the Society of Jesus 
the Jesuits for the reason of cleaning up not Protestantism because they were they were the those Protestants most of them were still Catholics but they didn't like the name so they, and so they breached off and called themselves Protestant and they had some disagreements but they kept a lot of the rituals including the blood drinking and the flesh eating ritual you know um, but the true Christians that were in the midst of it <clears throat> <clears throat> that were exposing Rome as being Antichrist like the Tyndales and the Wycliffs like um, Martin Luther like men like that like Charles Sprogen or Spruce or whatever his name is that openly will tell people that the seat of the Pope is the seat of Satan that they are the Antichrist and all of the anybody else that's born again that has a relationship with Jesus through true Christianity and a true walk with Jesus disconnected from Roman Catholicism as their leader this is what they're trying to clean up with their false doctrines when they tell when they come and say well hey you can't be a Christian and have a personal relationship with Jesus if you are not a member of the Roman Catholic Church if you do not come back to us <clears throat> Or if you have been excommunicated by us. Well, they excommunicated uh, Martin Luther after Martin Luther excommunicated them. Martin Luther excommunicated them on their most festive three-day festival called Halloween. That they, they called it Halloween. But the original name was Sam Haynes Day. Sam Haynes Festival. Samhain Festival. The pagan festival of... The demons, so-called, really, they're making no the, the demons, but the the the, the veil, so-called, between worlds, being at its at its thinnest, so you can talk to your loved ones again, you can make a connection with the dead Roman Catholic saints, and you can even your personal loved ones you can connect with them on Halloween, uh, which is the same thing as uh, Samhain. And Sam Haynes. Those three days, not just the, the Eve day of it, but those three days are days to commemorate the dead and not just honor them, but to channel their spirits through necromancy and divination. So, again, don't get mad and preach a sermon against trick or treat Halloween. If you're not going to admit to the origin uh, that existed before the commercial version of it, the commercial version that brings in a lot of money to somebody, <laughs> somebody's making money off it. Um, the the original origin of Halloween, the ones that still run it every year, that got people eating the hollow mass, as they call it, the mass of the hollow. All Hallows Eve, All Hallows Day, and All Souls Day, November 2nd. They're eating human blood, eating human flesh and drinking human blood, calling it Christ's blood on their hollow mess. But no, it is the blood and flesh of dead people that they're eating at the mass. And they're convincing people, out of circle people, by the billions that it is the blood of Christ and the flesh of Christ. And if you've been a former Christian now that you're Anglican or whatever that you are now, so it should be easy for you to do it, right? Because you used to do communion, right? So they're basically telling you that your communion that you used to do is an evangelical now that you're Catholic or now that you're Anglican. Uh, it's the same thing. And they're right. It is the same thing. But one is lying to everyone in the evangelical circle saying that it is metaphoric or figurative. And that's why we keep the ritual. No, you keep the ritual of communion because the the Protestant, early Protestant movement that that formed in the name of Martin Luther uh, kept the the ritual and did not change it. They just changed the the meaning of it. 
and they and and no one wanted to admit that Rome added it into the into the Bible to make it look like Jesus was say saying to do it also contradicting the Old Testament where Jesus said don't eat the blood don't eat the type and shadow of my blood don't eat any type of my blood not the real or the metaphoric version of it the figurative version is the metaphoric version is the type and shadow version of Jesus' blood which is the animal's blood and the wine being poured out you don't drink you don't drink or eat the the figurative version of Jesus' blood so to sit up and say for us taking communion is only figurative it's, it is sin it is cannibalism it is disobeying what Jesus said in the Old Testament when he said don't eat the blood the blood is the life of the flesh if you eat the blood I'll cut you off <clears throat> Aaron when he did the ritualistic blood of Christ with the wine he was not told to drink it he was told to pour it out on the altar so if you if you drink that wine now why would Jesus turn that into now now I'm representing Aaron in the Last Supper and I'm drinking the blood so you drink it too no the reason why I'm Jesus drinking the blood at the Lord's Supper is because I'm the Jesus that the Roman Satan to the Roman Catholicism added into the scriptures to get the reader to believe that this is the real Jesus drinking his own blood and passing it out to his disciples when clearly Jesus all throughout the Old Testament said do not, do not drink anything that is a representation of my blood a figurative metaphor or figurative representation of my blood well I'm drinking this grape juice or wine to figuratively represent no but then Jesus said don't do that because that's a type and shadow of Jesus's blood you're supposed to be taking that grapefruit and pouring it on the floor not drinking it otherwise Jesus is a liar for saying this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ear every when Jesus did his Lord's Supper it was a type and shadow of fulfilling him being Aaron for the last time. Him showing Aaron and Aaron doing the blood ritual, the Passover, and the pouring out of the wine, and the breaking of the bread, and breaking of the animal flesh, the lamb, for the last time, and the pouring out of the blood, not the drinking of it, but the pouring out of it, for the last time. Once the ritual part of that is done, now it becomes dinner and you eat it. Eating it is not the ritual. They turned to eating it and drinking it into the ritual and edited that into the scripture and put it as words, putting words in Jesus' mouth by adding a false, false Jesus into the very inspired scripture that had the real Jesus in it. And by the time it's translated into our language, it's in our Bibles. And because the early Protestant church, when they first formed and broke away from Rome, they did not get rid of the ritual they just kept it and it was in their writings in their encyclicals even good men like Tyndale and Wycliffe it went over their head and some good people that some of the good people that were maybe good that translated the kingdom it went over their head they kept it in there they just didn't delete they took up everything a lot of other things out like Maccabees and things but they left that part in they were not supposed to leave that in or it was supposed to be taken out now through uh, ministers and servants like us doing what Tyndale and Wycliffe in the Bible and the King James Bible translators did removing certain scriptures that don't belong we're that we're that of this day removing certain scriptures that don't belong that paint Jesus in the in the wrong light that created a false Jesus a serpent eating itself or Boris a serpent eating itself eating his own flesh this whole story about the pelican that eats his own bites off his own skin and gives it to his kid that's what they that that's what Jesse Delano Ellis said that the Roman Catholic colors that they wear represent the white part represents the pelican's flesh that he eats off and he feeds it to his children. That's that's the Eucharist. Jesus I'm representing Jesus biting off my own flesh metaphorically and giving it into the mouths of all the other people that follow me. 
That's cannibalism. The pelican doing that. It's cannibalism. Where's uh, Where's Jesse Delano Ellis getting it from? The same place where T.D. Jakes and Paul S. Morton gets it from. I believe in the one holy Catholic universal. Cannibalistic priesthood. It is the only legitimate priesthood. Yeah, because they preach that pelican eating his own flesh to feed his children with his own flesh. Cannibalism. They added that cannibalism into the scripture eons ago in their own Greek version of the writing of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Deleted, and they got rid of the ones that, the original ones that didn't have that in it. Clearly, clearly, the Ouroboros, the serpent eating itself, eating its own butt, licking its own butt, eating its own tail, internally, represents etern uh, et uh, living eternally for them. She said they're cleaning up Christianity, which means they clean out the evils of Christianity. And that's exactly what Alberto Rivera, former Jesuit priest, said that they were hired to do when he was a Jesuit priest. Was to go and convert true Christianity back over to being Christian. And that's what they consider cleaning it up. He's not lying because it is written in the, I wrote, I read it myself. It is written, it is written in the, and, and I sound like this because there's, I'm, I'm opposing right now those that don't believe. Like Jason, hello. <laughs> you see Jason on there confronting me. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love you, man. But still, uh, sound to wake up. Um, but anyway. Yeah, I read it. I, I read it in, in the catechism. I read it in the catechism. They, Alberto Rivera is telling the truth. And their assignment is to turn true Christianity, to turn us out, to convert us into Catholic, Catholicity or Catholic, Catholicism, universalism, infinity, wholeness. A serpent eating his tail. A serpent god. To turn us into a serpent god eating his own tail that lives forever. That's their version of eternal life. Counterfeit version of eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ. So when they said when they eat Jesus' flesh and drink his blood is the way to have eternal life. They're saying like this, that, that's like the pelicans doctrine eating the pelican feeding his children his own flesh this is giving you eating my flesh and drinking my blood is giving you life lies 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 more lies the the only the only thing that the sacrificial lamb in the old testament and the pouring of the blood of the sacrificial lamb and the other counterpart to that the shoe bread being broken and the wine being poured out represents it does not represent eating and drinking Jesus after it is broken and poured out it now becomes dinner the sacrifice I mean the sacrifice ritual part is over with it's done now you eat it so it doesn't go to waste but it was just a symbolic representation when you were breaking it when you were cutting it throat and pouring the blood out when you were taking the wine and pouring it on the altar when you were taking the shoe and bringing it, it only symbolically represented the brokenness of Jesus Christ's blood and the wine represented his blood going to pour out and uh, of Jesus Christ's body he's broken and the wine's going to pour and the wine is his blood pouring out the contract of eternal life being poured out not going in a circle being poured out not being consumed and eaten to, to receive eternal life like the Ouroboros eating his own tail Eating his way into infinity, eating his way, eating his own flesh, eating his way into eternity. A God eating his way, eating himself, and making everybody else eat him too. Eating our way into being gods and eating our way into eternity by continuing eating ourselves. But Jesus' blood is not consumed. His flesh is not eaten. It is poured out and it is broken. That's it. It is, oh, I'm sorry, backwards. It is broken first, and then the blood pours out. That contract, the contract in that blood, represents eternal life. 
washing over anyone that believes on him to wash away their sins. Creating a new spirit within them, born of the Holy Spirit, an eternal spirit that yes can die if it falls into out of grace into vasi, but it's internal if it stays in God. Now the scriptures that they tweaked in there to represent their Ouroboros, eating of your own flesh, eating of God's flesh, and God eating his own flesh at the Lord's Supper. They tweak all of that into scripture, their Ouroboros witchcraft into the scriptures. This is eternal life, John chapter 1. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life one day in the, in the day of resurrection, right? lies because in the beginning it clearly says that if you come to me I will give you life and life eternal at the end of that same chapter it says Jesus is that's John chapter 1 Jesus is God and Jesus is eternal life another scripture says he that has the son has life he that has not the son does not have eternal life so just having the son of God living in you by the Holy Spirit you have eternal life already you don't have to work your way to it you don't have to because it was he did it all on the cross right you don't have to work your way to it jesus paid it all you don't you don't have to ritual your way to it by drinking blood and eating flesh that's not why i do not commit well then you you're disobeying the scripture because in john chapter 1 john chapter 6 it clearly says if you want eternal life you have to eat the flesh of jesus and drink his fl blood it says that Otherwise, you don't got eternal. You're never going to have eternal life, and it also defines that you're not going to get it until the last day when your body is being risen from the grave one day, <clears throat> when Jesus comes again. That's when you acquire it then, and no time sooner than that, which is which is counterproductive to receiving it as soon as you believe on Jesus. And this is also counterproductive to Jesus paid it all. At Calvary if he paid it all at Calvary why would Jesus then tell us but that's not all because it's something you still have to do ritualistically he wouldn't do that and if Jesus won't come with some kind of ritual it definitely wouldn't be it definitely wouldn't be cannibalism but that Jesus wouldn't even come up with anything ritualistic uh, to get us to gain eternal life one day because he said eternal life is gained through believing on the Son. If you believe on the Son, you're believing on eternal life. He that has the Son has life. <coughs> if, the, if the Son, which is eternal life, is the vine that lives within you, and he and you are the branches, and he, uh, he is birthing fruit within you, or growing and producing or putting fruit on you, then that means the fruit that is being a manifestation of the personality of Jesus Christ that is being birthed within you or that is basically grafted within you that is being put in you through spiritual growth guess what that means that means that you couldn't possibly you couldn't possibly even walk in the fruits of the spirit and walk in the spirit without eternal life living in you it will be impossible you would have to already have eternal life as your God as your vine as opposed to John 6 no you're gonna get there one day if you just eat my flesh and drink my blood nope cannibalism again it stops it stops the the ritual stops after the animal is dead and cooked is de and the ritual stops after the animal's dead how do we know because they don't burn Jesus on the cross do they but every type of shadow of Jesus is burned on the altar so the ritual stops after the animal is dead and the, all the blood is poured out right and the laceration of the animal and the blood pouring out also is symbolic to Jesus being pierced through the side, through the side with a spear, and his blood and water running out of him. Right? Living water. 
again, not to drink, but to wash away the sins of the world, purification through eternal life, washing away death. Life washing away death. Yeah, I know, I know that there is an amalgamation of and a web of scriptures that are interwoven within our brains because it's written in the scripture and we're told that the scripture is, is infallible. That's where they lie to us. Okay? The, 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 even the inspired scriptures that, the, that Rome did not add into one book with, I mean, even the, yeah, that, that Rome did not tamper with <clears throat> are not infallible. Even within the context, it shows you unfallible men making unfallible choices, infallible choices, but yet being used as apostles. Paul, we can agree to disagree. Paul maybe should not be able to give his own opinions, but it's in the context of the scripture. I, Paul, would say to you, I, Paul, not the Holy Spirit, but I, Paul, would say to you. He said that. I, Paul, not the Holy Spirit, but I, Paul, would say to you. But now the Holy Spirit would say to you, huh? So you both get to speak? You get to make yourself equal with God speaking? I thought this was the unfallible, infallible word of God on paper. <laughs> huh? That was on the topic of marriage. In his own opinion, to his son Timothy, I would not have it. That woman should hold authority over a man. That's just me, though. That's what he's saying. Chauvinism is, has turned it into, no, that's God, inspiration. He clearly said, I. Okay. Again, but there are things that, that they temple with. They, uh, they basically installed the Ouroboros, which is the circle going around, and the Baphomet under it. Yeah. But clearly that they that they added that into the text. Why? To get the get the whole world eating and drinking blood, human blood. The whole thing is to turn Christians back to Catholicism. <clears throat> That's the cleaning process assignment that was given to this this band of separatist priests known as the the um the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. They gave Ignatius of Leo made him the face of it, of course. He didn't really it's not his idea. They made him the face of it. You know, even people like Albert O'Reilly that exposes him probably doesn't realize that he's the face of it. You know, he's just the face of it. 1548. Being launched 1541, the assignment. But the priesthood always existed in the desire to turn anything that broke away from it because of Martin Luther to bring it back was always their desire. They just need, needed to, to form a plan. They needed to, to conjure up a plan in their culture and a thought in their culture and they needed to conjure it up. And they needed a, the perfect way to launch it. And they launched it through forming a sect known as a priesthood sect known as the Jesuits Society of Jesus and gave that one man the credit for launching it. The goal is to clean up Christianity to bring them back to Rome. She said it herself. Helena Blavatsky, the Madam Helena Blavatsky, whatever, the cultist, the witch, she said it herself. The society was the Society of Jesus, the, the Jesuits, was to found it to remedy the glaring evils of Christianity. So they depicted that because of Martin Luther, everybody that is trying to be 
having Jesus without the Catholic clergy. They depict them now to be evil. And they made doctrines that says you cannot have a person relationship with Jesus without the Catholic Church and the priesthood. That's why they hired people like Jakes and his leader Quander, his spirit, other spiritual father, Quander Lear Wilson, ordained Jakes on the stage, but behind closed doors they were already Jesuit brothers. But on stage they did it for the people as a as a a way of making a connection with the people in the pews minds of this is how we're connecting you with Rome through ordination services by the one holy Catholic Church I ordained T.D. Jakes and his other brother over here brother Souse and um, you know and they will have mega beginnings and all of a sudden BAM they get mega churches Jakes how about South? I don't know how big he got, but Jake's got big. Satan has different levels of how big he's going to make them, but their goal was to get all the people watching to believe that they were true Christian ministers when they were really Jesuits the whole time. Putting on an ordination show, the whole, the whole underlining thing that would expose it all is that those Christians sitting in those pews knew what the catechism said that the one holy catholic universal universal um, one holy catholic apostolic church and its apostolic see and its working by apostolic succession is actually the seed of satan trying to get the christians to believe that bible characters like peter have something to do with it like he has a throne on earth that he never really sat on. That was, he sat on it when he was in the Bible. There's certain excerpts in the, my King James that I see that Rome actually put in there where Peter was standing up like he was really a pope. Making somebody die for lying. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. They added that too. To make it seem like Peter was standing as God. You have not lied to man. You have lied to God. To make it seem like Peter was, was acting as God in that moment. You don't touch God's money. You don't touch what they really mean. The translators really mean is you don't touch the Vatican's money, and if you have any money that you want to give free will, like a like an indulgence, you have to bring the amount that you said that you would bring. Otherwise, God will make you drop dead, like this story of Ananias and Sapphira that we added into the Bible that you don't know we added in there. Peter, the first pope, standing up there making them drop dead for telling a lie, but he gets away with lying and cussing. And God is not a respecter of persons. At the end of the day, we come to the conclusion and the understanding that God is not a respecter of persons. If he let Peter live after telling lies and cussing, cussing people out while lying, he wouldn't have Peter stand like, like a pope or like a proxy God over some guy and some girl named Ananias and Sapphira and make them drop and cause them to drop dead on justifying it. If anything, the real Peter would have been like, we forgive you, go and sin no more. Just don't lie about the money no more. That's the real deal, Holy Ghost. Feel. Personality. Peter would clearly understand, I was forgiven for lying. <laughs> you know? Which means God doesn't use killing people God doesn't kill people and use it as a fear tactic. No, he doesn't kill his children and use it as a fear tactic to make his other children afraid. Just because of lying about money, he doesn't do that. And anybody that believes that God will do that has in them a heart of a stone heart. Cold. Growing colder and colder and colder. And they keep seeing... They grow, they're turning they're turning into Jonah. Even with things that God reveals that will happen one day, many people believe from those prophecies in the, in the New Testament that God in the old and New Testament that God says he's gonna to do to humanity one day. Um it's like they wanted to, those particular prophets that prophesize those things today it's like they want it to happen today that's why 
Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Stop dipping into those Old Testament prophets. Because if you start prophesizing those things, you're going to, it's not that they're lies, but if you're going you're gonna to get ahead of yourself and you're going to lose touch with the ability not to be cold towards people. Not to have mercy and grace towards people. And you're going to have a, you're going to have the craving for God to hurry up and finally start killing people. And that's not God. God's, I only could pray that God would, would tell you to stop doing that. Maybe he's telling you that through me right now. Stop doing that. If God reveals anything to you about what, what, what he's going to do in this planet. To people one day after the dispensation of grace <clears throat> I would have you as my brother and sister in Christ that are get going away from mercy and grace and becoming cold in your prophecies cold to stop doing that you're not a heartless humanity you're not heartless Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. God is not going to tell you, and then you start hearing your voice on top of God's voice and thinking it's still God's voice, and God starts telling you to stop telling Him to forgive people. God's not ready to tell you to stop telling Him to forgive people. You're under the dispensation of grace as a minister. You're not. If you are an Old Testament prophet, then you are, are trying to replace Jesus, the prophet, under the dispensation of grace. You're out of order. You're out of order. That doesn't justify all these false prophets that prophesize blessing, 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 blessing. No, but it does warn you that you, your heart will grow cold toward people. And anybody that has hurt you in religion or outside of religion, you thinking that you're uh, putting a wall around that now makes you even colder in your prophecies. And now you think that this voice, you might have heard God 10 minutes ago, but now this other voice edited itself in, you think that's God too? Not. God would never tell you as a prophet or prophetess. to stop praying for people and stop forgiving people. Not even for the witches and warlocks that are running the country. Everything, everybody that we expose as a false prophet gets the, has the right to be prayed for and, and ask God forgive them Father while you having us expose them and tell people that they are wolves and that they are taking people to hell and trying to get Christians to die and go to hell. At the same time, Father, forgive them. Can you please forgive them? And find something in their circle that can make them have enough courage to walk away from Satanism and tr human trafficking and pedophilia. Don't tell me God does not save people that kill children. Paul slaughtered children, babies, boys and girls, and adults with Rome. And God saved him. God saved him. Okay? Blinded him for three days by accident. Well, it's not by accident, but I mean, Jesus knew that he was going to go blind. I mean, I'm not trying to do it, make you blind, make you blind, but... I know that if I appear before you at this radiant of glory, guess what happens? I can dim the light if I want to. Because clearly when I came back to talk to my disciples, after I was already ascended to heaven, I came down and sat down and ate with them. They didn't know who I was. 
So Jesus could have dimmed the light when he appeared before Paul, but he decided, let me, let me go in my glory, this guy. Isn't that going to blind him? Yep. I'll give him a sight back. But wait, he just killed people, children and babies. I know. I'm going to make him great in the kingdom. I'm going to forgive him. All the spirits of those babies are with me right now, but I'm going to forgive Paul. Death was just a doorway. And guess what? A portal of going to sleep and, and waking up in heaven for those babies. And for those adults, if they, believe, if, they fear, if they had a fear of reverence for God, if they reverenced God when they died, they went to be with God, the ones that Paul called, killed. Well, Paul called, killed Christians, so yeah, they went to be with God. So basically, but he was forgiven. He got forgiven after Jesus shut him down. And now Paul had been hardened and been like, no, Jesus knew he was, going to, he was not going to be hard, though, because that's why he specifically chose Paul, because he knew something was in Saul of Tarsus that he could use, that, that no other Roman that he could use, because they would have been like, no. Some of, some of them gave him, were even being stubborn after meeting Jesus and being blinded. You know, that's how strong the demons are in some people, but not Paul. You know? Again, we progress. We see the Ouroboros. This is what Helena Petrovna Blavatsky is stating in her uh, her writing that the uh, theosophical Mahatmas article, the society, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, was founded, founded to remedy to bring a, a cure, a healing. The glaring evils of true Christianity, is what, not Catholic Christianity, but true Christianity, to get to bring them back to Catholicism. That's what she's talking about. That's exactly what Alberto Rivera warned, what his mission was as a Jesuit. The Jesuits were founded, and you can read it in his magazines, the Jesuits were founded for the task of going cryptically in the midst of Christianity, pretending to be Christians and slowly indoctrination through indoctrination and lies and even demonic powers of you know, if given any like the Janice and Jim healing false healings and stuff, miraculous things that they can do, convincing people, real Christians that Catholicism and Christianity are, through indoctrination, are the same. See? Hence, getting those people to submit to putting themselves under a T.D. Jakes, under a Paul S. Morton, a Justin Delano Ellis, a Charles E. Blakes, a Carlton Pearson, a Prophet Manasseh, Elijah Jordan, a prophet Michael Turbin, a prophetess Juanita Bynums, putting themselves under any of these prelate pre bishops and archbishops as a member under their authority is becoming unknowingly becoming a Roman Catholic becoming a Catholic governed by Rome they, they're gonna say no it's Catholic is not it's not Roman Catholic but it's just Catholic see we might pledge to Catholic the Catholic Church but we don't we didn't say Roman Catholic Church but when they say that just go back to the Catechism because the Catechism will tell you what the four marks represent one holy catholic church represents it says catholic is un universal and it says that it is governed by the, the church in rome that's what it says in the catechism so it is the roman church that governs the the one holy catholic small c 
they just say small c to make it seem like it's not governed by Rome, but it is. And all other church, small churches that submit to that and that pledge that, the, the bishops that pledge that, they are Jesuits already working for Rome, pretending to be Christians that come in to the midst of true Christian ministers and convince the Christian ministers that the way to be a legitimate minister is through, through this way of confessing the Nicene Creed, making a pledge and swearing oneself to the, the one holy Catholic apostolic universal, apostolic church, to get in line with the order of the apostolic succession to be a legitimate bishop and a, and a legitimate apostle. And when those preachers give in to that, they turn give their little flocks that they had right on over to that false, fictitious, satanic power, that power that claims to be God's power, that jurisdictional power that claims to be God's power, Yahweh's power. And in the catechism, it calls these churches the Potter's House, Christian Crenshaw Center, Bible, I mean, I don't know, Gateway Church, um, Victory Church, um, World Changers Ministry Church, Benny Hinn Ministry Church, <clears throat> Gateway Church in Texas, uh, yeah. Rick Warren's church, Saddleback Church, all these churches, and all of the Pres Presbyterian, Episcopalian churches that are coming to economical, economical, <laughs> ecumenical oneness with the universal Roman church, drinking blood with it, eating flesh with it, pledging the Nicene Creed. All of these things in the catechism are called particular churches. They call it in the catechism. These are particular churches and their ministers, you know, bring the people, you know, make the flocks be a part of it. I'm paraphrasing, but that's in the, in the catechism. I read it. Yeah, go back to this. It's the Ouroboros. The Ouroboros is the serpent eating its tail. It represents wholeness, universalism, Catholicism. Ouroboros is the god, the serpent god, representing eating his own flesh, eating his own tail, eating his own flesh. A God that eats his own flesh and, and doles it out to his, his members to eat it as well. That's not Jesus. They added that in the Bible to make, make it seem like Jesus was into that. But it's clearly contrary to Jesus when he was God in the Old Testament that clearly said, yeah, eat the animal for dinner. Eat the bread after you break it, but as a meal, but don't drink the blood. Don't eat the blood. Never eat the type a uh, figurative version of Jesus' blood. That does not change. So and when Jesus is doing the Lord's Supper, he's doing one final version of Aaron at the dinner table, which is the altar at that point. Luke chapter twenty makes it very clear. After the wine was poured out. Because after he poured it into the glass and they drink it as his blood. No. After the wine was poured out in Aaron ritual. The blood of Jesus pouring, being shed. Okay. So again. Yeah. That's what it represents. And Jesus would not go against himself. He's not going to contradict himself. If he said it in the Old Testament, don't eat or drink the blood, he would not then change his mind in the New Testament and say, hey, take a whole cup of it. You can't, and then add to this, add, add to that and say, you can't be a part of me if you don't. Which undermines him accomplishing everything on the cross by just simply pouring his blood out. I'm saying there's a ritual you got to keep doing in order to be a part and take part in me paying it all for you on the cross. Did he say that? No, he did not. He said, just believe, only believe. 
no ritual or works or rituals can accomplish that. I accomplished it by just letting them beat me up and I died for you, and bled for you. I accomplished it all just by that. I accomplished it all. If they tell you, I said, eat my flesh and drink my blood as a way of obtaining what I did for you on the cross or either keeping what I did for you on the cross, they're lying. They're lying. If they tell you, well, it's written in, in an infallible book. There are no infallible books. How do you know? One way you know is that it wouldn't, it wouldn't have to say Holy Bible. Do we go around, we got holiness living in us because we, we uh, got the Holy Spirit in us as Christians and we are being trained to grow spiritually, to, to, to grow our way up into godliness and up into holiness. So, but do we stamp up the words holy on us or do we just go around and nobody knows until we start talking? We don't stamp holy on us. We're going to outward thing to make us look holy anytime a Christian somebody calling himself a Christian has to or a, a Christian or, or a Christian does something outwardly to make the outward world see holiness try to see holiness upon me through my clothes through a writing on my head that's proof that I'm not holy really holy that's proof that I'm not because holiness is not a clothing fashion Holiness is not. Holiness is not a writing on the wall. Holiness is not a writing on my forehead. Holiness. Anytime somebody has to write the title "holy" on the on the front of a book, that lets you know right there, the book is in, is not infallible. They're trying to make you think that it is. It means that they added things, like Jesus said, they added something to it. Revelation chapter twenty-two, verse eighteen through twenty. They added something to it, they took something away. They mess with it. So they can mess with you psychologically. And make you get a false representation of God's personality. And God's will and desire. If I told you I, I'm, I'm paying it all on, by dying for you on the cross. I don't need you to do, to do a blood, a human blood eating, blood drinking and flesh eating ritual to obtain eternal life or to hold on to what I accomplished for you on the cross. Just believe. That's why he keeps saying over and over, you want it? Eternal life? Only believe. Only believe. Just believe. Just believe. Do not fear. Only believe. Just believe. Just believe. Do not fear. Only believe. Just believe. Just believe. What about the rituals? What about the rituals? The man made. Jesus again Jesus did the last Aaron Passover animal sacrifice bread breaking wine blood pouring not blood drinking but blood pouring ritual at the Lord's Supper, the real Lord's Supper. The one that they added to in the our Bibles added satanic occult blood drinking and flesh eating. To justify the means of their religion. So, again, and and uh, there was the beginnings of when they did that. Somewhere in the A.D.s, they did that. They added that to the original text and got rid of the original Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and rewrote them. Clearly rewrote them, and added things to it. Little little things here and there to it, to tweak Jesus's personality, to make him afraid of death, to make him a a, a priest that eats his own flesh and drinks his own blood with his disciples. <clears throat> um, he said, you know, I would not drink or eat this again until whatever, whatever, until I come into my kingdom. But um, again, they're trying to make him out to be an Ouroboros. And those same people that tweaked it also created the doctrine that said, Jesus is the serpent. You know, he's Satan, one in eight, and with Satan. Jesus and Satan are one and the same, which brings us back to Helena, Helena Blavatsky. 
she also said that. The 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 theosophical society recognizes and knows of and therefore avoids and uh, its representatives and in and in its ranks but one enemy an enemy common to all namely Roman Catholicism so here she pretends to be the enemy of Roman Catholicism what she is is just either jealous or outwardly they're trying to create a um, double, uh, a double, like a um, two things for people to choose: her occult or Rome's occult. You know, and here she clearly agrees with the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, for trying to clean up Christianity. In other words, trying to turn true Christianity back over to Rome. That's what that means. Something that she she said that is going out of my mind that Helena Blavatsky said I think it was about the Jesuits. It'll come back to me later or something. It's another statement that she made. Oh, about she she said she quoted in one of her books that Satan Lucifer is the Holy Spirit and the Logos. That's not just her belief. That's theosophy. Occult belief. That's Rome's belief too. She said, she said, Lucifer is the serpent. She said, Lucifer is the serpent and the Holy Spirit and the Logos. That's Roman theology. Lucifer, they praise Lucifer at the Roman Catholic Easter ritual. Ritual. You hear them singing, Lucifer, flaming Lucifer, flaming Lucifer. La la la. Son of Seth. Not son of God, son of Seth. The ancient deity, pagan, mytholo pagan mythological god, Seth. Lucifer, son of Seth. Lucifer. Flaming Lucifer. They're singing it every year. And they don't care. They don't care that there's many of us online right now telling Catholic people and other people they're clearly singing to Lucifer. And every time you tell a Catholic that, they go into satanic denial because there's a block, a black hole in there. Some said that only the Holy Spirit can block. The Holy Spirit can't do it if they don't want Him to. Right? He can't breach it if they don't want him to. But yeah, they have it that Lucifer and even the cockroaches represents a bird of prey, a bird of paradise. Lucifer, the owl is a, is a Lucifer for them, a bird of paradise. And the cockroaches, part serpent, part... part... Um, uh, cock. What did they, they call a cock? A cock, a cock a doo -doo -doo or whatever. You know, rooster or whatever it is. Part rooster, part serpent, yeah. Um, they call it the bird of paradise. It's a serpent. A baby serpent in the scripture. It's a, it's a cockatrice. It's a serpent. It's, a, it's, it's Satan. They're saying that it is the Holy Spirit. That is the Locos. That it is Jesus. No, they won't call him Jesus. They call him the Holy Spirit. They call him the Logos. They'll call him. That's the that's the Roman theology that she teaches too. It the Roman Catholic, i.e., Roman Catholicism, not only obstructs the way to theosophy and occultism, but threatens to to throttle both so throttle could mean a couple of things 
but um, I looked at the word throttle earlier and it showed a um, a device controlling like in a car a throttle I guess it's in a vehicle a device controlling the flow and fuel or power of an engine see that it's like she's saying she's trying to have an independent like she has her own independent satanism or occultism and that Rome is even trying to control that that's why she said they, they practice a deeper a darker form of black magic and occultism and she feels at the time she's acting like she feels by her writings that she feels overthrown but but Helena Petrovna Blavatsky again is an occult face an occult face it's almost oxymoronic because occult means hidden face means open but if she's open writing books and saying I'm an occultist that's the occult hiding in, in plain sight an overt, an overt occult is always there to mask that the Vatican are the real Satanists but she's in, insinuating that they're the real deal that's what she's saying she's saying that they are throttling both theosophy and occultism she said that the, in other words the being the device that controls the flow and the fuel and the power of it but she's having to admit to that because it's, it's coming from the womb of their thoughts the whole idea of her so-called religion called theosophy um, throttle now a throat a gullet a windpipe verb attack to kill someone by choking or strangling them so ambiguously it reads as though she's saying that they're trying to throat they're trying to choke or strangle theosophy and occultism but at the same time she's saying they're trying to be that controlling mechanism that fuels it and powers it and controls it okay and that's what they do you know that's what she's saying because that's what they do to every religion they're the head they want to oh, at least they want to be the head of everything they're the head almost they're almost the head of everything we cast our gauntlet at the at the dogmatic theologies who would enslave both history and science the and especially the vat at the vatican whose despotic pretensions have become hateful at the greater portion of enlightening crescendum so she's saying that they're part of the portion of enlightening crescendum but she is recognizing that they are also a burden within the midst of it and a problem within the midst of it that's not real crescendum crescendum is not real Christianity anyway but anyway we progress <clears throat> so there is one thing that she said that let's see if we can't pull up oh we gotta go back to search let's see if we can pull up Psalm 41 King James Version 40 Helena Bl uh, so. According to researchgate.net, Helena Block, Alexander Zarbov. <laughs> Helena Blavatsky, the Holy Spirit, the Logos, Lucifer. I pulled up some images for you. This is her. This is the symbols of her of her religion. This one has a few symbols on it. She's got the um yeah, open that. Let's take a look at that. She's got the um 
This is the symbol that they use, at the, even on Kevin Copeland Ministries, when they was drinking blood on TV, slitting their hands and drinking blood. They did an, a sermon, excuse verse, and they said, well, the priests would drink. And you know, they said that the, that the three-letter Y thing represents, it's a Christian symbol, this Hebrew symbol right here. It's supposed to represent something about the name of God. It was either on that one, or I think it was on another one. No, I think it was on the one with with the, the false prophet known as, um, not Perry Stone, that's another one. False prophet, the false prophet known as Jonathan Kahn, artist. He <clears throat> said that this was, and many others say that this was um, the name representing the name of God. They're lying. Because when you look it up, even in the Strong's Concordance, which doesn't even have a big amount of stuff in it, if you look in the Strong's Concordance, that it's not the name of God. It is a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, but it is, they, they only, they take the end part of the element, the last part of the element, uh, what do you call it, syllable of this, and they say that's the name of God. Well, what about the first part? They keep leaving out the first part, which which has nothing to do with the name of Yahweh whatsoever. See that how they did that? They split it like they always do. They took it they took something away from it to make it mean God's name. Right? This is of course representing what is this? An upside it's like an upside down omega. Um what's an upside down omega symbol? Omega, no. Omega, alpha, omega. Or it may be an omega symbol. I think it is an omega symbol. Maybe I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> it's not hooking into my psyche right now. But this is just another version of the other one we looked at. Okay, so let's come here. And that word that she said. It's in her book. Disgusting, disgusting, disgusting. Disgusting. Yeah, see that? Even that IHS. Oh, represents God? Represents, oh, no, 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 no. No, it's all occult, everyone. It's all occult. Uh, they turn their occult symbols over to representing any, anything that has to do with God's name. And stuff. So, quoting Petrovna Blavatsky, she said in the Secret Doctrine, her book Isis Unveiled, and the three volume Secret Doctrine, Masters of Wisdom. I think this is the book where she quoted that, coined that statement. Lucifer is the Logos. The bridge to freedom and and summit lighthouse, which evolved into the church universal and triumphant, no single organization or movement. See that? She's endorsing Rome. She's endorsing it by right? pretending to be against it, just by making statements against it. Alberto Rivera did say that there were some priests that came out and pretended to preach against. They were allowed to preach against the Vatican and the Pope and, and say that they were Antichrist, but they themselves were spies pretending to be against when they were really not. Yeah, Satan hires people in the occult to do that all the time, preach against the occult. T.D. Jakes all the time says, I bind every witch and warlock and goes right into ancestry worship and all kinds of spiritualism in his pulpit.
Blavatsky theosophy taught arcane, arcane knowledge, gnosis, the universal brotherhood of mankind, and unity among all religions. See that? That's the Jesuit goal. She's preaching against the Jesuitity, but that's the Jesuit's goal too. And then that was that guy, that Jewish guy that, that created Hanukkah, earlier called Day of Dedication. And that was his goal too. Bet you the Jews won't tell you that. His name was Helios, like the sun. <laughs> no, his name was Hel Helios. Yeah, he lived, he was an adult when Jesus was a kid. You know, I think Jesus kept his, his kept his, uh, they said Jesus kept Hanukkah. No, Jesus didn't keep Hanukkah. Because Jesus knows Helios' true heart. And he knows that the heart of that man is universal. Universalism, paganism. So he knows better than to keep any ritual or feast. It's a Jewish feast. No, it's not a Jewish feast festival that Yahweh created. See? <laughs> they can call it what they want to call it. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. It's really pronounced Hanukkah. Excerpt and monotheistic unity among all religions ex, uh, except the monotheistic religions. <laughs> Christianity, Islam, and, and Judaism, which she insisted could not, well, Rome was trying to get all of them, but back then there wasn't, right? Which she insisted, but well, there was planned to do it, they had it over there on their blueprint, which she insisted could not be uh, reconciled with what she termed the individual enlightenment Lavosky damned Yahweh as a capricious and as a capricious and unjust and unjust you know she she doesn't like for she damned the Christian God but she didn't damn she didn't damn Allah they're going to say, Allah and Yahweh are the same. Witchcraft. <laughs> Witchcraft much. But clearly not. They're clearly not the same God. God. God, in her view, was the God of the Israelites. And nothing more. She insisted that the Holy Scriptures were wrong. It was it was really Lucifer who was... Now this is someone's opinion of what they think that she believes. Who was the good and the just. Well, this is the teach. Well, she believes this is the teaching of the New Age religions and spiritism. Who was the good and just God are victimized by the harsh and unjust Yahweh. Like not like not like Gnosticism preaches. Blavatsky maintained that the name of Satan belong belonged by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all gods and not to the serpent and not to the serpent which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. Hurt. She's not the only one that believes this. She's believing this outwardly, but the Vatican and Jesuit believes this secretly. She somehow reasoned that Satan slash Lucifer is God, the Creator, the Savior, the Father. And that Jesus is the firstborn brother of Satan. The Mormons believe something like that too. Okay, she wrote, Satan 
the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and benefactor, then why did he get his butt kicked? Why did he get stomped to the ground to eat dust? What, what, how powerful a creator is he? You know? Blavatsky, she wrote, Satan, welcome cousin Deborah. If you're still on, <laughs> I've been on here for a while. So it's been a while, I don't know if you're still here. She wrote, Satan, the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and um, benefactor, the father of spiritual, of spiritual mankind. For, for it is he who opened the eyes of Adam, created by Yahweh. She doesn't deny that Yahweh created Adam and Eve, but she said that the real that the real God, the real creator, is Satan, is the serpent. That doesn't even make any sense. It's like she's she's making it up. If she really believes that she's making it up, she's definitely making it up and putting it out there on purpose. And she's writing it in her books and writing it on purpose. She's doing that to mask the Vatican who is pretending to be from God. See? Who's really from Satan. Who really hold these beliefs themselves in darkness. Uh, Yahweh, uh, Adam, as she said, for it is he who opened the eyes of Adam created by Yahweh as alleged uh, an adversary to him. He still remains in esoteric or occult hidden truth and uh, the ever loving messenger who conferred us who conferred on us spiritual instead of physical immortality whatever yeah but that's the t that's the belief system of the Vatican they believe the same thing that Satan is God. That's why they say Jesus is the is is the serpent that heals. Satan is the serpent that kills. But then they praise Lucifer as a god. And there's no difference between Lucifer and Jesus really. Under the Vatican they got a in the catacombs and they got rooms, they got one image of of Satan with the halo on the white horse and they got a in another one they got Jesus on a white horse. And they almost look identical to each other, like they're twin brothers, like she's saying, like that, she's saying that Jesus is Satan's brother. It's the firstborn brother of Satan, but not his twin. But under the Vatican, the image of Jesus that they say somebody left there the earlier Vatican people or whatever left there in the image of Lucifer look almost identical to each other, like they're brothers, you know, and they're Caucasian. Okay. She proclaimed, she claimed to have had experience with astral projection. Let's get to the secret doctrines, which she called Lucifer. Here, right here. The secret doctrine where um, there's another one called the, the, um, the secret. What was the other one called? It's going out of my mind, but. The other one we read, I posted the other day, is that I took down. It's just disgusting. But anyway, the secret doctrine were supposedly channeled through through her by the the master of wisdom, masters of wisdom, Tibetan holy men. <laughs> In her book, The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky wrote. Lucifer represents the life, thought, progress, 
civilization, liberty, independence. And it is Lucifer who is the God of our planet. The Bible says the God of this world. It is Lucifer and Satan who is the God of our planet. The female version of him is Gaia. Gaia is is welcome at T.D. Jakes's and Woman Without Loose. The pastor now, the leader of Woman Without Loose is Sarah Jakes, who on her webpage, Woman Evolve, endorses Gaia meditation. To the feminine name for the God of this world is Gaia, the spirit of the earth, the spirit of this world. Okay. They know that. Jakes and them know that. Nigga said, oh, no, no, it doesn't represent that no more. Yes, it does. You can't, you can't Christianize occult stuff, you know, and then say it's now, now it belongs to Jesus because I, T.D. Jakes, is endorsing it. No, no. You're trying to be an occultist and a Christian, a, a sneaky occultist pretending to be a Christian. Um, again, it says, it is Lucifer who is God. And our plan. I know it's hard to break free from TDJ because he gives so much great advice, and he's got meat, his meat hooks of apron strings in our soul. So we tend to quote the things that he says, and intend to keep forgetting that he is not of God. He is a wolf. Not only he is a wolf, he is a he is a secret Jesuit and a secret occultist, apparently. Okay. So again, it is Lucifer, she says, who is the god of our planet. Gaia is the feminine version. Jake's preaches Mother Earth stuff at Easter. Okay? Womb and tomb theology. Uh, and the only God. And she continues. The celestial version, which thus becomes the mother of gods and devils at one and the same time. For she is ever the ever loving beneficiate deity, but in antiquity and reality. Lucifer and Luciferius is the name. Lucifer is the divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Spirit and Satan at one time, at one time and the same time so no the guy that was quoting up here that was saying she believes that Jesus is Satan he must be inferring that she never said it but you know she really believes that because every occultist really believes they know that Satan is the enemy of God and that God is really the good guy and they, they try to do what the inner circle witches and was they know, and they, in their heart, and hidden, hid, hiddenly, they know that they believe that our God is Satan, the adversary to them. That's maybe what he's trying to say when he opens up. But here, she's not open. He's not saying that she's. I don't think he's trying to say she's openly admitting to that, because here she's openly admitting that she's calling Lucifer Satan, and she ain't got no problem with it. So again. She also says that he, he is the, the, the Logos. Um, I'm not seeing that here. This is crazy, right? That's some crazy stuff. Um, I need to. Yeah, I was going to say I need to save this. I really do. Let me get this. Let me copy this and put it into my... Let's put that into my... Um... Let's put that into my... Thank you, Deborah, for all the love. Let's put that into my... Um... 
inbox here so I can hold on to that link. Lovaski. Okay, so she also said, but she also said more than that. She said that, and it's not just her her thoughts. See, again, Blavatsky, the fact that that's open in that day when they created that, the fact that it's open for the world to see, the occult, when they, when you see an open occult, an overt occult, they're overt to cover up the ones that are pretending to be angels of light. And they give out little belief systems of the ones that are pretending to be angels of light as well. Okay, so Lucifer is the logos, Helena Bolvasky. It's not how you spell it. I pulled up some images for you. That's Lucifer. This is she's quoting the mind of, of demons and devils. She's quoting the mind of, of Satan. Hey, where's the rest of my? Where's that thing that you make it go over? Thus Lucifer, <clears throat> the spirit of the intellectual enlightenment and freedom of thought is metaphorically the guide, guiding beacon which helps man to find his way through because Lucifer means light bearer to find his way, his way through the rocks and sandbanks of life for Lucifer is the logos in his highest and the adversary in his lowest aspect both of which are reflected in our ego Helena Petrovna Blavatsky the secret doctrine See that? Of course, we know why they made this. And everybody knows it's going to be entertaining, but Hollywood always makes entertaining things that are, are meant to enter the minds and give people a soft side for the devil and good vampires falling in love with people and wolves and warlocks and the devil himself represented by human flesh you know falling in love with people and fighting demons to, to rescue people from the other demons and yeah so
We just came from this, didn't we? Yeah, we just read this. No. Right here it says, Lucifer, it's her quote, Luc and, and this is the belief system of the Vatican as well. Luc Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. And it is Lucifer who is the God of our planet and the only God. And she continues. The celestial version. Okay, so we read that on the other one. But this is what she said. Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, and the savior. Now, in Roman Catholicism, or she pretends to be against, but admits that they practice blacker and darker black magic and, and, and occultism than she does in her own statements. Um, they are the real church of Satan in the earth. And their doctrines, they not only sing to Lucifer on Easter, but they declare that Jesus, who is the Logos and the Savior, is the serpent, which is Satan. And they twist the scriptures to make it mean that. Moses holding up the serpent in the, in, in the thing, that's Jesus and Satan. They got minions out there like Kenneth Hagin preaching for them, pretending not to be Catholic, pretending not to be Jesuit. Jesus, I mean, yes, uh, he knew that God wasn't his father no more because he became one in nature with Satan. The cross is the place of defeat, but resurrection is a place of victory, which means Jesus got defeated on the cross, but when he resurrected, that's when he got his victory. That's Kenneth Hagin. Crypto Jesuit kind of again. They said that the double cross represents Jesus' defeat or Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and then his his resurrection. That's what they said. That that this double cross represents they're double crossing God. They said this represents God, but it represents you as God, God as God. Like a universal God, because this universal is its wholeness is the Ouroboros. It is, the, but it's the serpent eating its tail. The Ouroboros, meaning the serpent is God. The serpent is is the Logos, the Savior, Lucifer, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They said they they said uh, Patrona Bovaski is clearly is clearly a Roman Catholic. She's clearly um, more than that. She's clearly a Satanist. She's an open Satanist because she is stealthing for Roman Catholicism, even though she doesn't have much good to say about it. Like some Jesuits are assigned to say bad things about Rome and admit that Rome is working for the devil, some of them. Again, they're hired by Rome to do that, to, to get Christians to trust them and when they get in there into the Christian community and the Christian churches the Christians they start infiltrating with Catholic theology and Catholic you know and, and, and making making make sure that yeah, it's the popes but it's not the Catholic people or the Catholic system. So you can accept the Catholic system, but if you say anything against the Catholic system other than just not the Pope saying something against the Pope then that means we'll accuse you of talking against the Catholic people no I'm talking about your system is satanic the people are just like any other people a part of a religious organization that has been duped I grew up duped all of us have and many of us have woken up on some, many levels yeah. Yeah, they couple all these things, and 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 she they even said that she said was that Jesus and Satan are brothers. Are bro I used to think that at one time too because of that teaching of Lucifer 
Satan used to be a good guy named Lucifer. And I used to say the same thing when I, in the Black Hole book. I wrote that in the Black Hole book. That I was inspired to write by God. I add, added that in. That Lucifer, our fallen brother. He used to be our brother. Lucifer, first of all, Satan was never named Lucifer. We went over that in another series. Nowhere in the Bible does the devil call Satan Lucifer. Look up that term Lucifer in your King James. It will not be translate into Satan or angel. It's just an expression that should not be there that was left in there when the translation, English translation was made from the Latin version. The Latin Vulgate popped that word Lucifer in there. It used to be in Hebrew, Halal, meaning morning star. They changed it to Lucifer, light bringer and light bearer. That's what the torch, luminescent torch represents, Lucifer. That wasn't Satan's name back then. He changed it later to get people to worship him as a light bearer, as a torch, the flaming torch, the morning star, right? But technically, but they left it in there. So because, and then when they c convinced everybody that the Bible is infallible, so when, and they told everybody a story that's not even in the Bible, and connected it to that word Lucifer and Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. Was still not Satan either and convinced us that, that there was this one angel named Lucifer his, his name was Lucifer that used to be the highest angel in heaven even higher as Michael or higher than Michael that used to be head of the singing in heaven he decided to exalt this throne above God and this and that quoting from Isaiah chapter 14 verse 1 through whatever one through the end, one through twelve, or one through fifteen. So basically, because it is a prophetic book now, it has to be something that happened in heaven. Yeah, or because it's a prophetic book, it has to be metaphor. That's dangerous. Like it never really came to pass. Like the characters are all now are all now metaphor and not and, and not to be treated as real characters that really existed that really had interaction with each other so therefore Isaiah never really confronted the king of Babylon and never said that stuff to him because that is whitewashed and covered over with the story of Satan used to be Lucifer a good guy in heaven saying I will exalt my throne no the king of Babylon, Tiglapausa, from Second Chronicles and Second Kings, and Isaiah chapter 14, said that. Not put my throne in heaven, that's impossible. Exalt my throne means I'm a king, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to exalt my throne above the cells of God in the minds of the people to get them to worship me as a god, so I can also be thought of as a god sitting not just as God himself, but as the gods, the fallen gods, sitting in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north where the gods congregate. In mythology, the gods congregate in the, in the mount in the sides of the north. I don't know. Zeus, Dionysus, Diana, Artemis, Hermes, Helios, all congregating, making decisions over humanity or whatever in their world of thought running the planet. He wants to be high like the gods. King of Babylon, Tikapausa, the Assyrian. Isaiah was told to prophesy against them. He was trying to exalt his earth throne, make it sit as the seat of God, higher than the stars of God. There's no, there's no fictitious storyline of a demon, one demon named Lucifer trying to overthrow God in the Bible anywhere. Romans, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 12 reveals to us what really happened. It was not one demon. A dragon with seven heads and ten horns represents seven demons, 17 demons. Ten demons 
led by seven heads, seven demons that overthrew and drew with their tail the rest of the third of angels in heaven, a third of the angels in heaven, and they became also known as demons. Not one among them was named Lucifer. That's Catholic theology. It's Catholic theology. It got in our Bible because it ended up first in the, in the, in the Latin Vulgate Catholic Bible. And when it was translated, when they translated the King James Bible, because King James was baptized Catholic, but raised Protestant, Satan, him, Satan through him, left certain elements in there that were not taken out, that needed to be taken out. There's no other story in the King James Bible that ever references the term Lucifer ever again. And so, and, and, it, and there's no story in the Bible of an archangel that was in charge of music. This is not there. It's not there. All they did was tweak certain words and terms and change the definitions. Like the word korab in Hebrew. Korab, singular, plural, plural. Korabim. They changed it to. They changed it to. I don't care. They changed the sound to cherubim. They changed the definition. The Rome. They changed the definition from imaginary figure. It's just like a, a sculpture of something else, of anything. It's called the Kora. The the Greek word, the Hebrew word for a figure, imaginary figure, is the word Kora, singular, and Kora bins, plural. No different than you might have the Greek terminology of my name, John, which might be Yohanan. Yohanan. Right? That's the Hebrew rendering of, of the English name John, Yohanan. Well, the Hebrew rendering of the English words imaginary figure is Korab and Korabims. The Hebrew word for angel is not Korah. It's something totally different. You can look it up in Strong's. It goes back to meaning messenger, watcher. Yep, any of this messenger, watcher, great one. Any of those. But on the list in the Strong's point, it'll never list cherubim because cherubim. It's coming from, it's the Hebrew word, korabim. It does not mean angel. It means imaginary figure. Out the door, imaginary figure. So the korabims on the Ark of the Covenant were, the korabims on the Ark of the Covenant were imaginary figures of angels. See how they played that? Because the, because the imaginary figures on the Korabims on the Ark of the Covenant, the imaginary figures on the Ark were imaginary figures of angels. Satan, through the Roman institution, tweaked the definition of the word to mean angel. Korabim can be an imaginary figure in the sculpture of an angel, but it has no life in it, no breath. Angels, messengers, watchers, great ones, they have life and breath. That's why in the Old Testament, anytime an angel appears, look it up in Hebrew and in English, anytime an angel appears, it'll never be called a cherubim in our English Bible. It'll be called an angel. Face to face, angel. Now, in the dream or vision, cherubim, because that's in the, in the vision area, 
that's a, a figure, an imaginary figure being played out in the realm of thought, in the realm of where we get our pictures, where God allows us to see things in our dreams, in the visions of the night. Now you can call it an angel in the dream or a corbin or cherubim in, in the dream because it's an imaginary figure. Now if I make a, a, a sculpture of an angel, I can call that sculpture a corbin or corub. And if I have two of them, corbims. Because they don't have no life. That's not angels. Well, that's an angel. No, it's not. That's a, a sculpture of an angel. It's called a, another, a sculpture, another way of saying sculpture in Hebrew is a lifeless figure. It is a korub. The Hebrew word korub does not mean angel. It means a figure of something. I watched over the years when I first did the Lucifer series years ago. Online, the Strong's Concordance had, had the same thing in my Strong's book. Years later, when I went back to do the series again, Rome had already infiltrated their online website platforms like Bible.com or not Bible.com, sorry, that too, but in a, in a way, but uh, not that, but Bible Dictionary Online.com and Witchcraftopedia, Wikipedia, Witchcraftopedia, and um, of course, I want to say the Catholic Dictionary Online because they, of course, they own that. And they changed it. They tweaked the meaning. I saw them. They added to the meaning. They added possibly an angel. They're trying to gradually, it's how to be sneaky. That's why they got the word possibly there. Because they know many people that don't believe that's an angel. Possibly an angel. Because they know the truth. That Korob and Korobims means imaginary figures. Possibly an angel means if you see it in your dream, it could represent an angel or it could represent something else. An imaginary figure or a Korob, a Korobim of something else. But they slowly started to tweak the meaning angel under the word Korobim. They did it online, and they did it in the minds of the people. All to justify that phony baloney story that Satan used to be a good guy, one particular angel named, now named Satan, used to be a good guy named Lucifer. No, they're all called Satan, all of the demons. They're all called Satan, adversary, accuser, accusers of the brethren. They are all called that. Not one. It gave them names. It even classified one angel in Revelation 9-11 and gave him a name. And it wasn't Lucifer. And it never was. It was called destroying angel. Abaddon in Hebrew. Apollyon and Apollyon in Greek. Dragon was the name of the demons that fell and got exiled in, in Revelation chapter 12. Dragon, serpent, they were cunning like serpents. They were angels, but they were cunning like they had the, the mindset of serpents, clever and like evil serpents, you know, and um, beguiling. Okay, so the government and the Vatican in Revelation chapter 13, known as the first and second beast, which are joined together at the hip, and the people that worship them. Why does, why does the first beast look just like the dragon, seven heads and ten horns, made up of human earth, worldly earth rulers? Why are they depicted as looking just like the dragon? Because that's the son or daughter, child of Satan. That's the son of Sam, the son of Satan, the, the, the children of Satan. 
global leaders of the planet from Old Testament to now. They are the sons of Satan. That's why they look like the dragon of Revelation 12. Uh, the first piece of Revelation 13. Seven heads, ten horns. Kings, rulers. On top of the pyramid of all the other kings in the earth. No matter who they are. Out from under God. In the Old Testament when God had his own kings. But when God finished off his earthly king thing through the last king his last king on earth was Jesus Christ David's throne his trans real throne jurisdictional throne is translated to heaven now the former throne of David on earth belongs to the devil and the antichrist is going to sit over there one day the Antichrist is already sitting there, but a physical, they got to put on a show, they got to give the people the show because they know religion, through in, in religious circles, everybody is saying that the Antichrist needs to come and sit in a, 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 a remade temple or whatever it is and announce himself as the Antichrist. Why would the devil do that? You know, he could do that after Christianity is gone and raptured out of here, he can do that. But why would he do that while Christianity is here? Why would he do that after Christianity is raptured, knowing that the world already knows from church theology that the Antichrist is the one that sits down and says, I'm God in that temple? It's too obvious. It's too obvious. Okay? Too obvious. So, yeah, they're going to give us the obvious Antichrist. And the obvious other antichrist that's going to pretend to be the real Jesus going against the antichrist Jesus they're both antichrist they're both false Jesuses the real Jesus lives in the heart of every believer the two prophets of, 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 of Christ will probably not be two angels or two men but most likely two groups of people in the body of Christ, maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Because the body of Christ is always made up of one. It's always meant to be one, one people. But the two witnesses that's another story for another day I gotta get back into the study of that to remind myself of what I learned I can't remember that right now but I know this that the um, the real antichrist is here already has always been here from Old Testament to New but every generation gets the antichrist gets a beast gets a mark of the beast gets a uh, has people falling apostate to it and falling and going to hell every single generation has that from Old Testament till now every I'm pretty sure every generation just like ours has had that same lie that went out that says the Antichrist is not now it's only going to come in the future because there is a man coming that's what they all say there is a man coming there is a man coming and they and they and they and they and they, and they put all their chips on that one man coming and they preach it openly. The whole world knows about it almost now. To it's so obvious that there's a man coming. And Jesus says, Satan transforms as an angel of light. And the ministers of Satan transforms into ministers of righteousness. So they're not making it obvious that they're the Antichrist. They're not, gonna make, they're not making it obvious that they're the Antichrist. Anything that comes and make it obvious that the Antichrist, you know, that that's the one that they that they're just giving us because we we expect that. But the one that's not trying to admit to that, that's the Roman Catholic priesthood. And and the secular kings of the earth, and they said, "No, we're Christians. We're Christians. We're Christians." And Rome is the Holy See. 
the holy S-E-E. -E. There's another word that the witches use for that word see. It's called S-C-R-Y-I-N-G, scrying, the holy scry. So that, but they said that see and seat mean the same thing. So the Pope, when he sits on the physical throne, the physical see of the Pope, it's interchangeable with scrying, so it is a form of peeping. Anytime they sit on that throne, they are given sight beyond sight, like the Lionel character, the third eye Lionel character on the Thundercats with the Sword of Bowmans. Sight beyond sight. So, at that, I think it's time to close because I think I showed you all the symbols, right? I did. I showed you all the symbols. I used to do long five-hour videos on my phone at one time when it was just audio years ago, back in 2011. Yeah. Before I started doing videos. And they will be long, too. But, um, yeah. But it, it has to be long. Anything that's half an hour 15 minutes in ministry you know if it's not passing an hour or if it doesn't have multiple 30 minute videos like hundreds of them then you know that there's a that there's no real message from god coming forth really so it's like i know words, the person doing it is bringing a message from god but they you know that it is pressed for time. It's always rushed. That, that's why cherry plucking the scripture exists. Because no one has time to read the whole chapter. And when you cherry pluck from the scripture, most of the time it leads to getting the wrong interpretation of what Jesus was saying because it's not the whole chapter kept in context. And then you can cherry pluck some scriptures from another thing and pluck those into another chapter if you want. You can, in other words, in the midst of false hermeneutics, you can eisegete the crap out of that text. Right? So, again, we progress. The Oreo cookie. Ice cold milk in the Oreo cookie. Filled with all the satanic symbology of the Roman Catholic Church and the satanic church of the Church of Satan. With your brothers in the blood and blood brothers in the eating of flesh, human flesh, clearly Again, I'll leave you with this. The sign of we need to, we need to better ask ourselves a question why the the archbishop symbolism is on the Oreo cookie. They're gonna probably come up with a quaint story. Well, you know, a woman captain made the batch and they just wanted to put this the symbol of their church on there and this and that and not tell nobody. See, being sneaky, right? Ice cold milk and an Oreo cookie filled with all the satanic symbology of the Ouroboros and the double cross of the Church of Satan and of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Byzantine Christian, Christian priesthood. That they call the what do they call it again? What is the double cross of Christianity? According to Wikipedia, the patriarchal cross the cross of Lorraine. Was that a cosmetic goddess? 
like Estee Lauder, the cosmetic god. Hail to the holy Estee Lauder. Lorraine, I've, this has popped up before in my studies. Lorraine is the culture and historical region of northeastern France, now lo located in the administrative region of dot dot dot. Oh, I think I know where this Lorraine popped up. I think I think Lorraine is where we got the statue of Libertus. The goddess known as Libertus. The demon spirit known as Libertus. Statue of Liberty. I think that's where that statue came from. Don't quote me on that. What part of France did the Statue of Liberty come from? Look at that, there's a smaller version of our replica of the Statue of Liberty. And theirs turned green too somehow. What is it about Lorraine, France? There was something, maybe it wasn't that, it was something else about Lorraine, France from one of our other stories. It'll probably come up again somewhere else. Something related to the occult. But anyway, ice cold milk and an Oreo cookie filled with satanic sim symbolism and the patriarchal crust of the Byzantine Christianity and the Ouroboros of Satanism that they call the Apos that they call the um, Archbishop symbol with Baphomet hidden at the bottom point my finger to him there he is right there and if you go to the website we just came from you'll see the church of Satan has an Ouroboros with the same cross with the Baphomet depicted at the top but still, you got your ice cold milk and your Oreo cookie. If you're consuming the symbols of Satan, it can be yummy to the tummy. I'm not trying to make light of the devil's work, but I'm just saying, look, I'm making a song out of it and all. But I'm just saying, that cryptically, isn't that what they're telling us? I don't think the, the original Oreo cookie started out with these symbols. But now it has it. Well, I mean, I guess you, I guess you can uh, start using this for, for, for your Catholic communion now. Or your Protestant communion. You know? It's got religious symbols on it. Right? Might as well go ahead and eat that. That four leaf clover symbol. Okay, let's see if Google's talking. What is the four leaf clover symbol on an Oreo cookie? According to Chef Reader, the symbols on the Oreo cookies go back to the Templar order. The Templar cross, arranged around the Oreo lettering or crosses that resemble a four leaf clover. This was the coat of arms of the Knights Templar. I knew that looked familiar. How can I, why can I see that? And all my research over the years, and that doesn't even matter, why can I see through memory, even, I look, that's clearly the nice Templar cross. <laughs> Who's making these cookies? It's got the Baphomet, it's got the nice Templar cross, it's got the Ouroboros on the double cross, which is the, uh, Archbishop symbol, but it's really the Church of Satan, infinity, God, they said, represents God. It is the serpent eating his tail, the Ouroboros, their God, their serpent God, holding up, I guess, 
stick with the the double cross sticking out of it the 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 matriarchy cross sticking out of it and the Knights Templar symbol what do you know I never thought to ask Google about that looks like a four leaf clover but no it is I'm looking right here this is the um, there it is right there let's look at that uh, what is the four leaf clover symbol on the Oreo cookie recipe is Oreo cake with five out of five stars on Preppy Kitchen. What is the four leaf clover sim assembly? What is the four leaf clover symbol? What is the four leaf clover symbol on the Oreo cookie? Here's what I found. Not a symbol. See to keep on symbol. What what does the four leaf clover on the Oreo cookie represent? While some people do recognize this ancient emblem, most consumers see it as a four-leaf clover, with each leaf emphasizing hope, faith, love, and luck. No wonder why the Oreo company has so much luck selling more than 95 million packages each day. No, that's... Shape photo, courtesy of Flipper.com. No, the other meaning that I got on my phone, the dark truth behind the Oreo cookie. Look at this. I didn't even know they were talking about it on there, but... Um, apparently they've been talking about it for a long time. This right here. Is clearly. The um. That's the um. The cross. That's the um. Crusader cross. The the. The Knights Templar cross this is about to look like somebody with their hands up this is the this is the Baphomet right here see that got a little over there this one looks more like it. See how it bulges out at the bottom? Those that's the nice Templar, yeah. The Knights Templar cross on the Oreo cookie. This is a different version. Double cross. It's a double cross.
here this is made to look like this looks less like Baphomet and, and more like the um, the uh, Freemasonic um, compass and square with the G in the middle that's what that looks more like on this one see it can be it can be um, like a uh, like an anagram it's like an anagram or oh, like um what do you call it an anagram is the, is the is hidden words but when you talk about pictures we're talking about like a um <clears throat> anamorphosis this could be like an anamorphosis because this one here is a, is clearly a baphomet this one here is clearly looking like the the freemasonic protractor somewhat like the protractor the uh the, what they call the um the symbol you know the um compass in the square with the G in it this changes if they put a dot in the middle of it, well it has a dot in the middle too Knights Templar Cross, there it is. One of them anyway. Knights Templar Cross. Alright, Knights Templar, okay. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> When Nabisco in general has the symbol, look at that. Right there, the Ouroboros with the double cross. Oh, Archbishop, right? Why is an Archbishop selling Nabisco cookies? No, it's it's in this one is inside of a pyramid. See that? The Church of Satan holds the same symbol as Rome. Or their archbishops or whatever. This is the Ouroboros, the serpent eating his tail. They said represents God and represents the self God and you know eating yourself. God eating God. And we I'm going to do that again, but with the double cross on it. Patriarch. They said it represents, but um, it's clearly um. When you get down to the degree, a double crossing, a double crossing God. That's what it is. Double crossing God. This is not the way God represents infinity. God does not represent infinity and uh, 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 and eternity with a circle or with a serpent in a circle eating his tail. He does not do that. He represents eternity and eternal life through believing his through his son and believing on his son. And that doesn't go in a circle. That goes in a straight line. Not backwards, but forwards in a straight line. Straight up. Straight up. This here. Yeah. Inside of a pyramid. This is inside of a pyramid. And then the pyramid is also known as the as the um tetrahedron. The tetrahedron tetra means four, but it also they said it means universal power. And and uh hadron is coming from even in our Bible from the word hadros and hadrios meaning a chair or a throne so tetra can mean four thrones but it means 
the throne of universal power to them. It means the throne and house in a pyramid. A tetrahedron, a universal throne, a universal power throne. It's a tetrahedron. They got the double cross inside the tetrahedron. Their symbols are disgusting. I was wondering Nabisco, for some reason, Nabisco, I don't know why they remind me of General Mills, that symbol. I don't know why, but they remind me of General Mills. Show me the General Mills symbol. Show me. Okay. Thank you. General Mills. No, I mean on top of the box. It's right in the corner of the box, right? How about this? Start past this. Stay. Not the symbol itself, but the, you know what I'm saying, watch. Show me a box of General Mills cereal. No, I'm wrong. It's not triangle. Why not? This one's not triangle. What about these? This one is inside of a triangle. Sort of a triangle. This one, too. Not that one. These are all the ones. Well, General Mills, a lot of this stuff got trisodium phosphate paint in, a, in the ingredients, and they tell you it's not harmful if, to, if you swallow it, if it's not in quantities, it's not harmful to the cereal, it says. But right when you go in the same grocery store over to the paint aisle, and you pick up a box of uh, trisodium phosphate, it'll tell you all the emergency things you need to do if a kid tastes a, tastes a little bit of it. Get that get that dude to a hospital quick. Keep out of reach of little children. So if it's if it is if trisodium phosphate is not harmful on cereal and they put it in kids' cereal all the time, why does the box of trisodium phosphate in the paint aisle just across on the other side of the store say keep out of reach of little children and harmful if swallowed and can irritate your skin and if it get in your eyes you got to do this whole flush ritual procedure you know if it goes down your throat you got to get medical help you know so I'd say to the people that like to buy cereal with trisodium and phosphate why not just get a, a regular box of cornflakes, right? Buy Kellogg's, which doesn't use trisodium phosphate, and then they use something else. Uh, 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 and then go to the paint aisle and get a box of trisodium phosphate, and then you can control how much, you know, trisodium phosphate you want on your kid's cereal. Whereas, you don't, in other words, this way you don't have to go by the amount that they, of trisodium and phosphorus that they put on. You could go by the amount that you want to put on. Control it. Right? Just sprinkle it right on. I'll give you less trisodium and phosphate, young man, than that company is giving you on the side of their box and the ingredients. Well. Would you put arsenic and old lace or whatever in your kid's cereal? Well, if you pick up a box of trisodium phosphate and you read the box of it, the back, the, the back of the box of it, and it says, harmful if swallowed, can irritate your eyes and burn your skin, keep out of reach of children, 
Are you now going to therefore, just because they did it, take, do the same thing? Take a little spoon and just sprinkle it in the cornflakes? Take a chance with that? I don't think most people will. But they won't mind buying that because they don't know that the ingredients on the side. And a lot of people, if you tell them, they'll say, hey, it hasn't hurt me this far. Okay, so get over to that paint aisle then. Get yourself some cornflakes. Get over to that paint aisle and sprinkle it on there and eat it. And keep doing that every morning. Every morning. Eventually, something's going to have to give. And by the way, after breakfast, you got a little oil stain in the garage from the, you know, from the oil dripping from the car. Just go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of that on there. Scrub it in real good. Then hose it down. Oh, wow, look at that. It broke up the oil. I wonder why. Wonder what is breaking up in your esophagus. What clogs is destroying in there? <laughs> Same ingredients, y'all. I'm not making it up. You can't make this stuff up. Okay, again. We progress. All the monster cereals have it. Uh, Franklin Berry, Fruit Brute, Yummy Mummy. Blueberry and Count Chocolate. All the holiday and Christmas themed General Mills, they have it. One of these days they're going to wise up and they're not even going to put it on the box anymore to make people think it's not there so they can keep eating it. Just like the Wonder Bread Company did when one day used to use bleach in their bread. Or, you know, not bleach, bleach. You know what I'm talking about. We, run the, we used to bleach their bread, and bleaching bread, not with chlorine bleach, but bleaching bread is unhealthy. So, when, when one the company realized they were losing money on these health kick people that were exposing the fact that, hey, that's bleached bread, you know what they did? I noticed, as soon as I went on my health kick and stopped eating that stuff, they, I was reading the ingredients, and it was regular bleached bread. Wonder all of a sudden, bam! Bam, just like that, they started putting un they started writing unbleached on the side. They didn't I know that they didn't go to them factories and just change all the chemicals at one time and just because they were lost money because you're not gonna sell the rest of what you got. Right? At best they maybe they did a recall. Send them all back and we'll repackage them. But we're putting them in bags that says unbleached. You change the chemicals? No. Too hard to do. Too much work. <laughs> it's still bleached. But if we're going to tell you it's unbleached, you know? And, and then let's make the color a little bit darker to make you think, see, it's not bleached. Trying to be smart. American cheese, which once said, a lot of American cheese, which once said aluminum. They st they started removing the word aluminum because people were being health conscious. They don't, they can't have us be health conscious. They can't. It's part of their, it's a, it's a part of the, their satanic sacrifice of humanity is to have the white coat, lab coat wearers preparing different foods for us that poison our bodies. You know, there's always somebody in a white lab coat at a CDC or some type of medical facility or food creation facility that's always preparing some, preparing some type of poison for us to inject or eat. All right, ice cold milk in the Oreo occult. Let us go. Here's the symbol right here. Or bars. This is the way they do this. It's supposed to look at the number eight, but this one has the two circles, but it's actually supposed to be the number eight. This is the one Anton LaVey uses at the Church of Satan, the dead Anton LaVey. The Church of Satan uses this. See, it looks more like the eight right here.
All right then, ice cold milk. And this is the symbol for what? Lucifer in Venus, right? Really, symbol for a church on the map. How ironic that it looks, it looks identical to the symbol for Lucifer. How ironic. Or Venus, as they say. Ice cold milk in an occult the old cookie. All right, ice cold milk in an occult the old cookie. In an occult reel, <laughs> occult reel. Let's bring this to an end. Got speed. Oh, don't close it like that, buddy. Let's just put it down here. Got speed. I love you, and the Holy Ghost, God the Father and the Son, love you much, much, much more. This has been. Uh, Whatever the title of this thing is. And <laughs> see you again another time.